good evening doctors thank you for joining us welcome to this webinar on a very very special topic deep brain stimulation we have galaxy of international and uh, uh, national stars who will speak on deep brain stimulation today uh, we have professor dr milind devgaonkar dr alistair jenkins dr milind sankhe on our discussion panel we have dr rishikesh kumar and dr divya this uh, webinar is this is a digital initiative coming to you from health and you a joint venture with new link company limited japan we always uh, introduce new innovative product to fulfill unmet medical needs uh, for example annual amitriptyline plus bicobalamin combination for the first time in india in 5 10 and 25 mg strength for neuropathic pain and for migraine uh, we followed that with anurite beta first time amitriptyline plus propanolol combination when one drug is not enough in migraine anurite beta 520 er and 1040 er we have anurite p for moderate to severe neuropathic pain where trigabalin is given in sustained release form to match uh, pharmacokinetic profile of amitriptyline Uh, it is pharmacological gives 24 hours of pain relief we have micobalamin injection imported from japan for uh, neuropathic pain we launched for the first time a new strength in clobazam add clobaz 2.5 mg 5 mg and 10 mg in mouth dissolving form this strength is required by pediatrician pediatric neurologist and by neurologist for down titration or for up titration Uh, it adds flexibility, adds control, adds clobaz in epilepsy. Uh, we have uh, baclofen, uh, bacrite with 45% less price, but more important than that, look at the size of the tablet, which is as small as this, bacrite 20x or bacrite 30x as compared to real size tablet of other baclofen available in the market. And recently we have launched a new concept, vitamin therapy for migraine, uh, Brentamin. Riboflavin 200, magnesium 200, and CoQ10. This is uh, recommended by ARN and American Medical Society. Uh, Brentamin for migraine. Uh, one can also use this in uh, growing children and migraine uh, uh, in pregnant ladies with migraine. This webinar and all our earlier webinars are available on our channel DG Neuro. Uh, if you go to YouTube and type DG Neuro, you will get a huge resource. of neurosurgery and neurology webinars uh, more than 40 webinars are now available on this dg neuro channel uh, that gives me uh, brings me to this uh, webinar which is conceptualized and moderated by dr amit kumar ghosh he is a consultant neurosurgeon from institute of neuroscience kolkata uh, also national neuroscience center peerless uh, hospital and dk roy research center Sir is a fellow of micro neurosurgery from Fujita University, Japan. Uh, fellow also in neuroendoscopy from Carl Strauss. He has undergone training in uh, leading institutes like Ohio State University under Professor Ali Rizai and today's speaker, uh, Professor Milind uh, Devgaonkar. Uh, he has also done uh, training in Nottingham University Hospital, UK, and. Uh, uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital, UK. He has been recipient of uh, two uh, prestigious awards: Mother Teresa Sadbhavana Award and Indian Achievers Award for Chikitsak Ratna. So I have great pleasure in handing over the session to Dr. Amit Kumar Ghosh, sir. Please take it over. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Nayak. I'm sharing the screen. I have a small presentation. Yeah, good evening to all of you. So today's topic, as we know, deep brain stimulation. As we know, the deep brain stimulation is electrical stimulation of deep cerebral nuclei by surgically implanted medical device called brain pacemaker or implantable pulse generator. This pulse generator sends electrical impulse to a specific nuclei of the brain, which need to be stimulated. I will just give an example. 
of my recently done cases, which me and Dr. Rishikesh Kumar has done. This was a pre-deviated dyskinesia. Levodopa induced dyskinesia, which you can see the way patient is, his quality of life was severely disturbed by this kind of dyskinesia. So, And that is the way he was after DVS, maybe after seven days of DVS. We can see the improvement of the quality of life he is much comfortable and can work. So in this uh, webinar, I welcome Professor Milin Devagakar. He will talk on targeting of GPI, how he does it. Professor Milin Devgakar is uh, in US, Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute, Department of Neurosurgery, West Virginia University Medical Center. Welcome, sir, and thank you for joining us. I welcome Dr. Alistair Jenkins, professor and senior consultant in neurosurgery and neuroscience in Newcastle, UK. He will talk on targeting STN, how he does it. Uh, welcome, sir. And I welcome Dr. Milin Sanke is a senior consultant neurosurgeon in Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai, India. He does functional neurosurgery. His area of interest is epilepsy, functional gamma life. He will talk on different targets for DBS. Thank you, sir, for joining. I welcome Dr. Rishikesh Kumar. He is vice chairman of our institute, Institute of Neuroscience, Kolkata. He is in charge of movement disorder program. He is the director of research in the Institute of Neuroscience, Kolkata. He's also a member of Executive Committee and Treasurer, Movement Disorder Society of India. He's a member of Education Committee, Movement Disorder Society, and he was he is the founder's president of Parkinson's Disease Patient Welfare Society of Kolkata. Uh, welcome, Sarah. Thank you for joining. I welcome Dr. Divya KP. She is a professor in neurology in Sijitra Institute for Medical Science, Trivandrum. Her area of interest is movement disorder, epilepsy, and clinical neurology. Her major achievements, uh, she got NRIR gold medal in Indy Medicine in MG University. Neurology India Award for Best Paper in Neurology 2016. And she published 30 peer-reviewed papers in different journals. Welcome, madam. I welcome Mr. Deepak Nayak and all the staffs and representatives uh, Mr. Santos Takale from Health and You uh, for providing us this platform. And it is indeed our pleasure to have you all in this session. We are very grateful and thankful to our speakers, discussion panelists, and esteemed audiences for sharing their time and thoughts. So now we can go to our first speaker, Professor Milin Devgalkar uh, for his talk. So, sir, please, Dr. Milin. Yeah. Let me share the screen. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes, we can see, sir. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, Amit is doing a great job in uh, functional neurosurgery and neurosurgery. In, so is uh, Institute of Neurosciences. Thank you for inviting me, Amit. And Mr. Naik, thank you very much uh, uh, also for inviting me. Uh, it's good uh, to be invited to this uh, webinar, particularly because I get to see Mr. Jenkins. And uh, I'm actually, I'm seeing him after, I think, 18 years or so still looks exactly the same um, <laughs> and uh, he's the first person i saw doing dbs before that i had no concept of dbs and uh, uh, Alistair, when you were doing dbs that's the first time i saw it. and i wanted to do dbs in kolkata so uh, when i was coming to kolkata i remember going to his office and asking him how to target and he promptly drew a piece of paper and showed me uh, acpc and all those things that was my first introduction to targeting I, I thought I'll just mention it. And it's good to see Milin Sanke, who has been a, a dear colleague for many years. So uh, uh, my topic is uh, targeting of bulbous pallidus. 
Um, I don't have any conflicts to declare with this talk, and I'll be discussing some off-level use of DBS. Um, targeting is very simple. DBS is, itself is very simple. It's not a complicated surgery. It's very simple. Uh, if you basically know your anatomy, uh, and if you don't know the anatomy, then it becomes complicated. Otherwise, it's very simple to get a lead in the nucleus. And GPI is much bigger than STN, so it's much, much more space, uh, and it's even easier to target. But somehow there is a myth that surrounds GPI, that it's complex targeting. It's not. It's, it's very, very simple. I got introduced to GPI uh, after I left Kolkata. Uh, I did one year of uh, postdoctoral fellowship in Cleveland Clinic before the physical fellowship. And in that, we used to, um, we had eight hemiparkinsonian monkeys, and I will sit in a Faraday cage whole day, and they had chambers uh, on their uh, skull, and we'll just map their brain 70, 80 tracks every day. So we'll go through GPI, we'll go through STN, and that firing sound was kind of ingrained in my brain. And then when I started working in Cleveland Clinic, Jerry Vitek was our neurologist. And Jerry Vitek is uh, a very, very strong GPI um, uh, advocate. So we used to do a lot of GPIs then. Uh, so after you do a few and after you see all the pros and cons of it, uh, you stop uh, having any hesitation. So targeting of GPI is very simple. And the second part of sentence I said is, as long as you know the anatomy about it. So if you are going to find a person, you need to know the uh, path, the road map to the building. That's about the anatomy of the GPI. Once you go in the building, you need to know which room he is in, and that's the somatotopy of GPI. And then you have to give it to the right person, so the message will be carried through wherever it is intended. And that's why you need to know the connections of GPI. GPA as a target, once we know all this, how GPA behaves as a target, uh, then what are the indications, what are different targeting methods. Over years, uh, last 20 odd years, uh, there is a transition uh, in um, targeting methods uh, from a hardcore MER-based targeting to more image-based targeting. And now newer uh, versions of imaging like tractography and probabilistic uh, uh, tractographies that makes targeting much more simple. Indication associated modification in targeting. Most of these nuclei have a kind of microchasm of functions and depending on the indication, you got to move the lead uh, a little bit here or there. What are the pitfalls, complications, and just one slide on how, how do you program GPI. This is just uh, um, from Abbott Stream Direct. Um, and this is just to show you sub particle nuclei. And just to give you an idea, what's the relation of GPE and GPI? As you can see, GPE kind of overhangs the GPI, um, uh, lateral part of uh, uh, GPI, and uh, superior part of GPI is all covered by GPE. So the more uh, lateral you move, more likely you are going to encounter GPE rather than GPI. And when you come medially, this is this uh, big, huge uh, uh, capsule that's there posterior capsule that kind of wraps around the GPI medially and posteriorly. So you've got to keep that in mind. This is just another picture. This was a diagram I think we drew for one of the papers and shows you uh, different parts of the striatum uh, GPI, GP in relation of where the STN, SNR, RN is in uh, where the GPI, GP and uh, striatum is. If you go to a simple uh, method, which you normally use in the OR is uh, Catlin brand Atlas, SW Atlas. And uh, as you can see, the first thing that jumps out to you is the size of the nucleus. Uh, if you're used to STN, uh, it's compared to this, this is about 14 millimeters. Of course, not all of that is relevant to us. The width is about four to six millimeters and the height is about six to eight millimeters. So it's a big uh, landscape and uh, so, and that's why more and more people do image guided targeting because there is much larger nucleus uh, to target. But uh, though it's a large nucleus, uh, it's not always easy to uh, target it. Uh, and uh, if your lead is in the right place, uh, the tip of your lead has to be on optic tract. The lead has to be in posterior ventral uh, GPI. Posterior ventral GPI is the best GPI. And then it comes out of GPE. 
and the lead of this type, this green thing is the capsule. So it's not too close to capsule. It's generally three millimeters away from the capsule, about six to seven millimeters away from the back of the GPI. So that's a well-placed lead. And this just shows you the anatomy. This is the uh, putamen, GP, GPI, and the optic track. If your lead though is medial, and then what it should be, it's too close to the capsule, you're going to get capsular activation. And it's very important in dystonia patients because you need higher voltage. You need more amount of tissue activated. And basically, if you cannot reach that voltage, you will not get desired outcome. It's also important uh, in Parkinson's patient because the ventral contact is the best contact. If you want antidiskinetic effect, uh, ventral contact is the best contact. And if that contact is not used because of limitation of stimul capsular stimulation, then you're left with upper contacts which go close to the GPE and that could cause problems with uh, um, dyskinesias and also uh, therapeutic benefit. Uh, if it's too lateral, it will end up completely in GPE and that's uh, generally of no use uh, as far as benefits are concerned. Having said that, once in a while GPE contacts will give you some benefits because GPE has connection to STN. Um, but uh, still, the leads in GP as such will not give you much benefit. We target a little bit lateral in Huntington's patient uh, uh, because um, the reward uh, circuit mechanisms are in GPE and sometimes some neuropsychiatric disorders, you can target GPE. But when you're talking about dystonia or Parkinson's, lateral lead uh, will not be useful as far as therapy is concerned. If it's too posterior, too close to the posterior end of the uh, GPI, again, it will stimulate capsule because as, as I said, the capsule wraps around medial and posterior part of GPI. And again, very posterior lead uh, will not, uh, uh, will have limited capsular stimulation uh, limitations. If it's too dorsal, this is one of the common uh, mistakes people see because there is a vessel right on the top of the optic tract and people are worried to go down uh, and so, if it's too dorsal, again, the contacts will be outside GPI or in the upper part of dorsal GPI. And dorsal GPI is, again, not so much useful. It's useful for uh, lower limb stimulation, but uh, it's not so much uh, uh, useful for uh, desired effect in Parkinson's or dystonia both. If it's too uh, deep, then it will stimulate the optic tract. And I've seen this once only. And uh, again, this is uh, very uncomfortable for patients. So, so We've seen what's around GPI, so you know what to avoid. So you know there is optic track, you know there is a capsule uh, uh, on medial and posterior side, you know there is GPE on lateral uh, uh, side and lateral and superior or lateral and dorsal side. Um, simplest part to, to remember is uh, brain is very simple. Um, it's organized in such a way that anterior part of any structure uh, is always limbic. Middle part is motor, posterior part is sensory. So when you look at the actual uh, parts of GPI, if you look at the parcellation of GPI, now these parcellations are functional parcellations. And I just put in thalamus here just to give you an idea what I'm talking about. And if you use uh, probabilistic uh, structural tractography, you can find out which cortical area projects in which part of the nucleus. And you can do that for thalamus and you can do that for GPI. Uh, we have done this in six patients in that uh, paper uh, is under uh, publication. It hasn't published it. So I used the images from one of the other neuroimage uh, paper. Uh, the red is uh, limbic. Uh, this is associative uh, and then this is also uh, associative. Um, and the blue region is the motor region. So if you look at, this is anterior uh, in all these uh, things, and this is anterior uh, on the right side. If you look at it, all the middle GPI, middle to posterior GPI is what is uh, sensory motor part of GPI. Uh, in some, it extends all the way posterior. Uh, in some, it kind of stops short of the posterior end of the GPI. Um, if you look at the axial sections, uh, those were uh, sagittal sections. And look at the axial sections, uh, it's still the same. Blue is the motor. And so look at this, the posterior uh, ventral GPI is uh, what is uh, motor. And as you go in the front, uh, you 
put towards the limbic GPR. And if right side, you have to be more careful because right side of any nucleus has more uh, limbic uh, uh, outputs. Uh, as you can see on the right side, the limbic part is much more bigger in this patient as well. So Pospero uh, ventral GPI uh, is the motor GPI. That's what uh, we need to target. And we have to make sure that at least one of the contacts is in the motor GPI. And uh, you can do this before operation or you can do this after operation and verify your location. Um, so that's about the uh, so anatomy of the GPI inside, functional anatomy of the GPI inside. What about the connections? Uh, I sometimes think targeting a nucleus is kind of, uh, um, people give too much importance to it. It's all about connections. So like in thalamus for tremors, the cerebellar connections is something that uh, you're targeting. Uh, same thing in STN. If you go to dorsal STN uh, field of forels or uh, posterior zona inserta, you get our posterior subthalamic area, you get as good benefit as uh, targeting the nucleus itself at a very, very lower voltage. So when you look at the connections of GPI, what's important is uh, palidothalamic tracts. Now, the way the GPI controls movements is uh, through palidothalamic tracts, uh, and also there is a hyperdirect uh, uh, palidocortical um, connections. So hyperdirect palidocortical connections are kind of, again, posterior uh, GPI. And uh, palidothalamic fibers, there are two sets of fibers which are important, and so lenticularis, and uh, fasciculus lenticularis. And ansa lenticularis comes out and stays below the GPI. So it's the inferior part of GPI that's uh, where ansa lies. And if you look at this picture, you understand why we target optic track when we target these patients. So this is uh, 1.5 millimeters in front of uh, mid commissural point. This is the optic track and this is the ansa. So optic track and ansa kind of completely oppose each other. So Normally, if you can do a tractography and you can see ANSA, great. But if you cannot, you're just doing 1.5 Tesla MRI scan, just target the optic tract and you will never go wrong. Basically, uh, optic tract and ANSA are just stacked one above another. So uh, this is 1.5 in front and the second picture is uh, phi in front. Uh, that's where the ANSA crosses uh, through the internal capsule, goes to the field of forel, and then um, goes to the thalamus. Fasciculus comes out a little bit higher up uh, um, and a little bit more anterior, and then again crosses the capsule and goes in the thalamus in the same place. So one of the things that you've got to do for, uh, especially uh, for dystonia patients, uh, even in Parkinson's patient, is try to target ANSA as much as possible. If you have a tractography, uh, then just do tractography. You can see ANSA beautifully on tractography. This is one of the pictures of uh, uh, DTI images, uh, and it shows you uh, the uh, GPI, and then all this uh, area below GPI is basically ANSA. So all the area, uh, medial uh, GPI, inferior GPI is ANSA. So um, this is another picture. It's not very well. These uh, probabilistic segmentations never show up very well, but this is the GPI, and you can see the ANSA uh, going from below the GPI towards the thalamus. So that's something that you got to keep in mind. That this is the, this is something that I need to target. Um, so those are about connections. What about somatotopy? And this was one of our papers which came back way back in 2009 or 10, I think, uh, 2010. And we had then 2,000 GPI neurons uh, and plotted them on SW Atlas. As you can see, uh, the more medial you are, the less neurons are there. These are motor driving neurons. And the blue are upper limb and red are lower limb. So as you can see, as you go to 21.5, you got the biggest concentration of uh, uh, motor driving neurons, upper and lower limb both. If you want to stratify them, then the upper limb neurons uh, uh, are basically uh, more lateral. You can see they are more lateral, they are more ventral, and they are also more posterior. So upper limb neurons are more posterior, uh, and this is not important so much in Parkinson's, but it's important in cranial dystonias. So uh, as you can see, the face neurons uh, are posterior and also ventral. So normally when I do dystonia, I go a little bit in front of the Parkinson's target but when it's a cranial dystonia, Mage syndrome, 
or Bruegel's or jaw opening dystonia, I'll go a millimeter behind just to get that posterior part of the um, GPI. So when you look at all these things that I just told you, what we learned, uh, anterior part is limbic, and that's a truth. That's a truth in any nucleus. So 21.5 laterality has the most sensory motor neurons, and you can target anywhere between 20 to 23, but 21.5 is a good laterality. Postero, ventero, lateral part is more upper limb. So posterior, lower down, and lateral is more upper limb. Anterior, uh, dorsal, medial is lower limb. Now this is not anterior GPI. This is anterior part of the sensory motor part of GPI, that view part that we saw in the back of GPI. Capsule is medial and posterior. Two posterior lead and two medial lead will cause capsular issues. Two dorsal or lateral leads will cause bradykinesia and will be ineffective. ANSA is something uh, that's the main pallidothalamic output uh, connection and it comes between 1.5 to 5 in front of MCP. So that's where your lead should be somewhere uh, in that region. There was a paper uh, way back, uh, I think in 2000, early 2000s by Bijani about GPI being a dual target. So dorsal stimulation improves akinesia and rigidity but worse, <laughs> worsens dyskinesia. And ventral stimulation has strong antidyskinetic effect, but may not help with the kinesia that much. When you actually look at the paper and kind of uh, analyze it, I think they were partly stimulating GPE. They're not talking so much about GPI. And they could be talking about GPI because uh, uh, the connectivity studies have shown that uh, the hyperdirect connections of GPI to cortex are more ventral uh, and not so much dorsal. So, if you are stimulating the hyperdirect connections, you probably will get more anti-dyskinetic effect, but you may not um, help with akinesia that much. So going to indications of GPI DBS. So just to tell you uh, how common uh, GPI DBS is or how uncommon GPI DBS is, um, last uh, uh, the 15 odd years I've done close to 2000 plus uh, DBSs, DBS leads. Out of which probably about 350 or so are GPI DBS. Out of all those leads though, more are Parkinson's disease than dystonia. So though we know GPI as a target primarily for dystonia, GPI is a very good target even for Parkinson's. And when do you use GPI in Parkinson's in, uh, and not STN? Um, when there are pronounced dyskinesias when dyskinesias are at low dose of levodopa. So if patient is only on half a tablet, you're still getting uh, dyskinesias. If you put a ST in DBS, uh, just programming that DBS becomes a nightmare. You go up by 0.1 or 0.2 and it will start causing dyskinesias. So dyskinesia, uh, dyskinesias at low dose. Patients, uh, Parkinson's who have uh, MCI, so uh, if there is a, a minimal cognitive impairment, and you're worried that doing bilateral ST and you're going to push that patient into uh, much more uh, severe memory problems, it's better to do GPI. Uh, the cognitive circuits of GPI are much placed in, uh, away from the sensory motor circuits. In STN, it's kind of packed together. So it's uh, uh, less chance of having a cognitive problem through GPI. Sometimes soft dystonias are predominant features. So PD dystonia, if patient has very strong off dystonias, then uh, I'll go for GPI. I done combination of STN and GPI both. Uh, we had, uh, this was one of our papers. Uh, again, it was published long time ago, 2011. Uh, it was a patient with uh, bilateral pallidal DBS who came to us and uh, the patient had uh, very good improvement in dyskinesias, but couldn't reduce the medication. And the off period wasn't extending. So we went ahead and put bilateral STN leads. The controversy is about GPI and PD. People say that doesn't give you as good uh, dose reduction, which is true, but it does give you dose reduction. Uh, and the whole idea of doing this is you kind of reduce the dyskinesias, so you don't have to reduce the dose, but still it doesn't. Effect, effects don't last as long, that's not true. We have uh, long follow-ups in GPI DBS and the effects last uh, as good. Tremor control is not as good as the STN, that's not true. Again, tremor control is exactly as much or even more sometimes with, G, uh, with GPI. Uh, second indication is dystonia, uh, dystonic tremor. Now dystonic tremor is uh, different than essential tremor. It's much more jerky, multi-axial. And um, those patients, if the dystonia part predominates, then uh, I'll put a GPI DBS. If the tremor 
part is predominant then i'll put a vim dvs huntington's disease now huntington's disease is a is a very very complex and variegated uh, uh, playground you don't want to go there as far as possible but if you want to select the target who is a younger dyskinesia predominant motor predominant with very little psychi psychiatric burden then that's a good candidate for gpi dps then other hyperkinetic disorders like hem uh, intractable hemibalismus Juret also people have used uh, GPI DPS though we haven't we always do thalamus or VCVS the um, ventral striatum ventral capsule target. The targeting methods, as I said, you evolve as a surgeon over time, and uh, initially you do what you are trained to do, and uh, then when you do that uh, for years, you know that maybe I can modify it in this way, uh, and then uh, newer things come around, and then. You change your um, way of doing things. So initial five, seven years, I think I did exclusive microelectrode recording. We used to do anywhere between three to 11 tracks for GPI. Uh, we didn't see any increased bleeding because of that. Uh, I mean, when I compare patients I did then and the ones I do now, uh, image guided, the bleeding risk is not different. Um, uh, then, then after that came a period, I started doing image-guided targeting. I did more pediatric dystonia, and those kids, we had to keep them under anesthesia. So we got OAM around 2008 or 2009 in Cleveland Clinic, and we started using OAM for targeting. Uh, and then now we also use tractography for uh, targeting. Uh, and uh, we still use microelectrode recording, but in very, very few cases, unless it's a research case or unless patient insists that they want microelectrode recording, I'll do that for GPI, otherwise I'll just do image guided. Uh, what imaging do you use? And uh, a lot of fancy imaging use nowadays in 3D uh, scans and uh, 70 scans, but I just use uh, um, uh, uh, T1 with contrast, uh, stereotactic MRI, uh, a susceptibility weighted uh, uh, imaging, SWI, uh, and uh, inversion recovery, f -gator. So those three are good enough for any part of the brain, anywhere. You don't have to do any additional sequences unless you're doing tractography and things like that. Um, when you select the target, you first find the ACPC. And always trust the ACPC-based uh, target more than image-based. Images have magnetic distortion. Images can sometimes fool you. ACPC will never fool you. So uh, I'll always do uh, ACPC-based targeting first. Um, and um, as far as the ACPC-based targeting is concerned, um, the X is around 19.5 to 21 for a lateral, Y is two to four in front of mid commissural point, and Z is three to four below uh, the ACPC line. Once you put that target, you then go a millimeter or two below and see where you fall on the optic tract. Um, anywhere on the optic tract is good. In a larger brain, I prefer medial edge of optic tract. In a smaller brain, I prefer lateral edge of optic tract, but anywhere on the optic tract is good. You then refine those uh, targeting parameters. Uh, for X, I use bitemporal diameter. We haven't published this, but this is something that I always see. If um, bitemporal diameter uh, from dura to dura. Um, if it is less than 130, uh, then I'll go target, uh, I'll target it closer to 19.520. If it's more than 130, 135, 138, then I'll target it more towards 21 and 21.5. For why, you also look at ACPC length and indication. So uh, if the ACPC length is uh, uh, too much, I mean, it's a large ACPC, more than 24. Uh, then uh, I like to uh, go less in front uh, because it's a big nucleus and I can afford to be behind. Um, if the ACPC length is below 24, then I would uh, rather go a little bit more in front. So I don't want uh, uh, stimulation uh, induced side effects. Also indications for dystonia, um, I'll go um, three to four in front for Parkinson's, I'll probably go just two in front of uh, mid commissural point. And the reason for that is voltages needed for those, these two disorders are completely different. For dystonia, you need higher voltage, you need double cathodes, you need higher pulse width. 
um, with Parkinson's, you probably need just single monopolar or a small bi bipolar with uh, um, smaller pulse width. So it's important uh, uh, to understand that uh, indication changes the target a little bit. And then Z, uh, uh, the Z is uh, refined by the vascular structure that sits on the optic track. It's a good idea to be a millimeter above that because there is always an error in your stereodactic frame. You don't want to have bleeding. Then trajectory. When it comes to trajectory um, for GPI, uh, you come down as straight as possible uh, uh, as far as the uh, angle from the midline is concerned. So if you have a trajectory like STN coming from lateral to medial, the contacts can go inside GPE and then they will be not so much useful. So try to come down as, uh, as straight as possible. Uh, so this is the X-ray of or a patient with the GPI and STN leads. Uh, and you can see the GPI trajectories are actually medial to lateral or at least straight as compared to STN trajectories, which are coming from lateral to uh, medial. And also uh, come a little more anterior. So again, you see the posterior bar holes are STN, the anterior bar holes are GPI. Because if the lead is a little more angled and you're getting posterior uh, capsular stimulation and that's limiting your stimulation, uh, then you can always go higher up uh, uh, in the contacts and you will go away from the capsule. And this is what uh, we used to do, do sometimes, uh, uh, MER guidance. Uh, and we have these frames, plastic frames of uh, SW Atlas. And then we'll do the first track. And basically this is uh, uh, red and this is uh, green and this is blue. So that's triatom, that's GPE and that's um, the GPI and uh, then we'll go for posterior margin, then we'll go for lateral margin and then we'll decide where to put the lead. Um, as far as the MER is concerned in GPI, it could be sometimes tricky, but most of the times it's all right. Uh, the only constant in GPI is border cell. So respect the border cells. And if you uh, know your border cells, you will never get it wrong. The stratum, the putum in is, uh, it doesn't uh, have much of the firing. It's kind of, very low background, you hear a crackle here and there, and that's about it. And then you hear this regularly firing uh, loud border cell. And so you know, you left putamen, you're now entering GPE. And then GPE is uh, very famously characterized by the bursters and pausers. So the pausers, you've got to uh, um, compress the bin a little bit to see the pausers. But if you compress the bin, you can see this pauser. So cells fire and then pause and fire and they pause. And then there are uh, sharp bursters that you see in between. And then again, you get a border cell and then you enter GPI. And GPI in Parkinson's uh, is fairly similar to what you see in um, subthalamic nucleus. Uh, it's output, output nucleus, it's loud uh, and the background is more. And, um, but GPI in dystonia is different. And uh, GPI in dystonia can sometimes be very similar to GPE. It can be uh, low background and uh, it could be, uh, it could have some pauses. So it's important to mark your borders. If you don't mark the borders, uh, you can miss uh, GPI altogether, especially if it's dystonia patient. In Parkinson's, you will never miss a GPI. So this is what we used to do. So um, this was the first track that we did. We always targeted 21.5. We always thought we are at 21.5. And when you go to 21.5, this area just behind a notch is the best area to have tip of your lead in. So um, when you do this, uh, uh, you do the first track and you get about five, five, five and a half millimeter of STN, uh, sorry, GPI. And then we used to go four millimeters behind. And then you can see the top drops and the bottom goes up. And then you start getting capsule higher up. Again, you get optic tract here, uh, you get phosphines here, and you don't get anything here. Uh, so we know we're at a posterior margin. So if it's less than three millimeters, and the bottom is very high up, and you're starting to get capsule, we know we are at posterior margin. And the idea was to put it about six millimeters in front. So this is four millimeters. You go two millimeters in front of this, and you will get the lead right here. But in addition to that, we also used to do a lateral tract. Uh, here also we'll go to about uh, three millimeters lateral to the track and 
a very small GPI, about two millimeters, uh, top very far down and bottom uh, fairly up, and you don't see capsule, uh, so we know that's the lateral margin. Stay three millimeters uh, away from the lateral margin. Sometimes two millimeters if it's dystonia, but about two to three millimeters away from lateral margin. GPI generally is about six millimeters in width, uh, if you look at that angle where the lead is. Um, and two to three millimeters lateral to the lateral margin is pretty good uh, point to have a lead. So after MAR, as I said, uh, the initial target is this, and then we go six millimeter in front of the posterior capsule and two to three millimeter from medial border or two to three millimeter from lateral border. Close to a track with at least five plus millimeter of GPI and phosphines. So if you get, you, you, uh, I have to explain you phosphines. When you are just above the optic track uh, and you start stimulating, you turn the OR completely dark, uh, you shut off all the lights and ask the patient if they see any stars or tingling in front of the, not tingling, stars or flashes in front of their eyes. And if they say yes, you know you are, you are sending electricity to the optic tracts. And that's one of the best ways to, uh, during micro electrode recording, best ways to make sure that uh, you are in the right place. So we did this uh, in a few hundred cases and then um, started thinking that you generally end up going to the first tract or maybe a millimeter in front of it. So why not to just target a millimeter of a millimeter in front and our usual targeting and just use image guidance. And by that time we had OAM and then we also had IMRIS. Uh, so, um, so we started doing that. We started doing that under general anesthesia and we used to make sure that patients don't receive any muscle relaxant. Uh, and we will test uh, EMG uh, sometimes. Sometimes we would not even do that. Um, we use the same kind of target refining schemes depending on the indications and depending on the size of the brain and other internal parameters. Um, and this is just a picture of OAM. And OAM is actually pretty good for these cases. In general for DBS, and I use OAM nowadays in awake patients also. It's good for putting your um, drape on it and uh, there's a good access to patient's head. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, the lead. Uh, you can fuse the CT scan uh, after the lead goes in with the previous planning and make sure the lead is in the right place where you wanted it. If it is less than one millimeter, uh, I'm generally okay with it. I will not revise it for that. And then uh, we also have the MRI guided one. I, I don't use it very often because it takes too much of time. It's cumbersome. It's not exactly sterile area and um, uh, I just don't like doing that under uh, uh, MRI guidance. Uh, so when you do image guided targeting, uh, remember uh, that uh, which are the dangerous sites of the nucleus and kind of are on the side of caution. So you know if your lead is uh, too, uh, too medial or too posterior, it's going to cause you problem. You know that sometimes the lead will deflect a little bit uh, uh, while you are driving it in. So I generally, if, if it was uh, two millimeters in front of MCP, uh, uh, mid commissural point, I would probably target it about 2.5 or 2.7 in front of it. Just when, when you round the numbers, I'll round the numbers to go slightly in front because uh, just in case the lead still goes back, uh, I'm still away from the um, capsule. Um, avoid pneumocephalus. Uh, we use extensive irrigation and our patients generally have very, very small pneumocephalus. It's important because when you are doing the second side, there is a large pneumocephalus, it will distort the brain, it will cause shifts. Of course, of course, the shifts at the level of STN are very little, but shift at the level of thalamus and um, GPI sometimes can be significant. I always use the outer cannula to the target. Uh, I've seen people uh, putting in leads without cannula uh, in some places, but uh, we don't do that. We have outer and inner cannula. And for MER, we'll use the inner cannula and then take it out and then uh, put the lead through outer cannula and drive it. But if it's image guided, I'll put the cannula all the way to the target and then just put the lead through it and then pull the cannula up. I think that helps uh, uh, that the lead is not kind of deflected to one side or another a little bit. It doesn't deflect very much, but even half a millimeter deflection can cause problems in outcomes. Also make sure that you remember that micro drive weight will tilt the lead a little bit. So it depends on which way you're, uh, if you're using um, 
flexel frame uh, and uh, your micro dryer is hanging the way you position the patient if the patient's head is uh, too high up and the, uh, you're going from an anterior entry point and the micro dryer kind of hangs down then the lead is likely to go slightly more posterior so it's never less than uh, uh, it's never more than half a millimeter or so but all these half a millimeters add, and then that can be a problem. So uh, just keep that in mind when you are using image guidance. We then, in OSU, started doing a lot of uh, tractography work. Uh, Krishna uh, came to work with us, and he's a big tractography guy. So we started doing connectivity-based selection, uh, connectivity-based uh, atlas, structural topography. And, um, you got to remember this though, it's very useful when you are use it in addition of regular targeting. Don't use it as a only way to target because DTI is very operator dependent. Uh, tractography images can be modified uh, and, and the change, once, once you change the filters and windows, they change. So just use that in addition. This is just one of the pictures of our uh, thalamus which shows uh, dentato thalamus rural DTR and uh, medial, uh, the lemniscus and all those things. Uh, so depending on the fiber direction, you can give them different colors. And we used it in GPI and I use it in GPI primarily for capsule purposes. I mean, you can see optic track for sure, but capsules are big fibers and they're always accurate, uh, almost accurate on DTI. So like this side, uh, I'll make sure uh, I'm at least two to three millimeter away from the capsule. And then you can also see a little bit of ANSA going down that way. So, uh, and then I'll also go up, up to uh, five millimeters or so and make sure that uh, all the upper contacts are also away from the capsule. And it's a good addition tool for uh, targeting of GPI. Indication associated changes in targeting, I already told you for PDE, I'll always go slightly posterior, for dystonia, slightly anterior, uh, for Huntington's disease, slightly lateral, and for uh, oromandibular dystonias, more to the PD target than dystonia target. And this is, uh, when I say slightly, it's about a millimeter or two. And again, it depends on all the other parameters, uh, size of the brain and everything. Uh, but that's what I change when it's uh, indication associ associated. Pitfalls, um, I, when leads come to revision for us, the most common we see are they are too lateral. So they're not doing anything. Or they're too dorsal. Because when people uh, do this, uh, closer to capsule, they know. If it's not closer to capsule, they don't know. So you get more laterally placed leads, you get more dorsally placed leads. Posterior targeting is uh, in that. Uh, MER in dystonia is deceiving, as I told you before. Um, trust the borders. Borders, uh, always trust the borders. Uh, again, don't chase the, chase, chase the phosphines. There is uh, sometimes people who do GPI mapping, they think phosphines is the holy grail. No, it's not. It depends on uh, what is there between uh, GPI, uh, GPI tissue and uh, optic track. If there is a vessel, the electricity will be taken away by the flowing blood and you will not see phosphines. Um, again, if the room is not dark enough, if your anesthesia machine is kind of blinking and blinking, they will never see uh, phosphines. Um, mapping uh, length of, of the nucleus is sometimes again uh, don't try to uh, chase for uh, how long GPI you get. Uh, you see distance between the borders rather than cells. Uh, again, that's for mapping. If you're not doing mapping, then that's not important. Directional electrodes are useful in GPI, especially in dystonia. Um, some people use 3387 because it's a large nucleus, but I always use 3389. And the reason for that is because it's a compact uh, lead, you get more contacts in GPI and you don't get upper contact going in GB. That way you can use more contacts for stimulation. Complications of GPI, hemorrhage and misplaced leads. Now we have seen, I think we have published a paper on risk of bleeding. I also always tell my patients, risk of bleeding in GPI is much higher than risk of bleeding in STN or um, thalamus. And the reason for that is those lenticular striate end arteries. These are end arteries, These come, they come from anterior circulation, the pressure head is much more stronger. Uh, and also the vessels in uh, GPI uh, has got uh, large uh, furcorobin spaces. So the perivascular spaces are huge. 
and that's why uh, getting the bleed in GPI is much more common than thalamus um, or uh, SDN. Again, I haven't seen a major bleed in GPI throughout my career, but again, that's that's uh, small bleeds uh, we see now and then, but uh, haven't seen a bleed as such in last a few years. Um, last slide is a uh, word about programming. Ventral contacts are the best. It's, it's, programming is very simple. As I said, DBS is very simple. If you are in thalamus or GPI, go for ventral contacts. If you are in STN, go for dorsal contacts. Uh, dystonia needs a larger field of stimulation. The more tissue you recruit, the more uh, benefit you get, at least especially in DYT1 positive dystonia. Interleaving helps in PD. The newer, the new systems you can interleave, which means you can stimulate the upper contact and then stimulate the lower contact, and they can go uh, alternate with each other. And that helps with PD patients a lot. UIT1 dystonia sometimes needs lower rate, and Ackerman's paper on this uh, rate of 60 or 70. Uh, and I think that works in uh, UIT1 uh, positive generalized dystonia. That's about it. Um, it's nothing is complicated. I mean, I think uh, uh, the Rumi's uh, uh, statement is uh, very good. I, I love everything that Rumi says, that you're not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. So all this knowledge everyone has, you just have to look for it. Uh, and then it's very easy to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah, excellent uh, description about the GPI DBS. So my question to you, sir, uh, regarding the directional electrodes. So if there is a little bit of misplacement of the electrodes, uh, you have said little anterior, posterior in different indications. So how do you see difference in normal electrodes and directional electrodes? In your directional, directional electrodes, uh counter surgical errors. So there was a time if your lead is, uh, I mean, there's still, even still now, your lead is too medial and it's a normal electrode, you got to revise it. But if it's a directional electrode, uh, you're just stimulating the part of the contact, which is uh, lateral, you can get away with it. So uh, I think when you want to focus uh, the stimulation, uh, when uh, or when your lead is uh, slightly, um, inappropriately placed. Directional uh, leads can help because you're steering the current away. You're steering the current away from lateral to medial. You're steering the current, if it's too posterior, giving you posterior capsule, you steer the current. You just activate the anterior part of the ring. Uh, if it's too lateral uh, and you're not getting therapeutic benefit, you just activate the medial part of the uh, electrode. Yeah. So I think directional electrodes help. Uh, yes. But only- uh, Sir, in your- yeah. Yeah, in your presentation, <clears throat> you have one of picture has shown that both GPI and STN has been stimulated in one picture. In one, there is both sides STN also and both sides GPI also. Yeah. So in that case, uh, you first did GPI or first did STN. So both. Uh, we have we have about uh, maybe seven, eight, maybe, maybe 10 patients like this, where we did both. And these are patients who came from outside, already had one set placed. And then they came to us because something wasn't improving. So like in this patient uh, with the picture, they came with the pallid lead. So great help in dyskinesia, but- um, So it was done, done for Parkinson's disease? Yeah, 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 of course, Parkinson's disease. Um, I do STN for uh, dystonia, but uh, I only do STN for dystonia, not both leads. Uh, was a patient of uh, blepharospasm and uh, oromandibular dystonia where we did both STN and GPI and didn't really see any benefit. It was kind of overkill without any benefit. But in Parkinson's disease, yes. Uh, sometimes if you think the STN leads are working, uh, uh, but programming becomes an issue and you cannot go up, and then what you do, you take those leads out, the leads are not normally placed, then you add valid leads, you reduce the dyskinesia. Um, but if you select patient rightly beforehand, you don't need uh, both GPI, STN leads. These are all the patients who came to us because the leads placed 
um, not wrong, but in the wrong nucleus. And then we rather than taking the, uh, because you take the lead out, per lead there is about 10% risk of bleeding when you take it out. Uh, so uh, it's better not to, uh, if they're well placed and giving at least some benefit, you can complement that benefit by putting lead in another nucleus. Yeah. So now <clears throat> we'll go to Dr. Rishikesh Kumar and Dr. Divya regarding the indications. And uh, is Dr. Rishikesh here? Yes. Can you? Yeah, yeah. So first I will go to Dr. Rishikesh Kumar. Sir, uh, how as a neurologist you select your target in Parkinson's disease or rather GPI? When you do GPI, uh, when you select GPI as a target in Parkinson's disease? First of all, when we select the target, this is not my lone decision. I talk to my neurosurgeon and we make this uh, collectively. Uh, talking about GPI, of course, there's huge literature of uh, Parkinson's disease GPA targeting, but somehow we can see that uh, the percentage of GPI being done in India at least, that is reducing significantly. And majority of patients we are doing STL, thinking that it can benefit both ways. But in some patient which I had experience by well, fellowship and also here also, I feel that GPI has some clear role. And in those patients which were crazy dyskinetic, even a small dose of Leodopa that can cause dyskinesia, I'll uh, think about GPI. I'll tell my surgeon to think about G GPI. So when I am feeling that dyskinesia, then I'll think about GPI. Second thing is that uh, in some cases of young Parkinson disease, apart from bradykinesia and rigidity, we are a lot of bothered with dystonia also, especially in uh, genetic Parkinson's disease. Some patient, young patient, they have dystonia, which is quite prominent. To the extent mm -hmm. that dystonia can be presenting feature, in those cases, GPA can be one, uh, GPA can be discussed and we can, we can go ahead with that. So these two factors, apart from the lot of uh, subtle things are there. I'll ask Divya to chip in. Yeah, I, sir, I agree with you. Like most of the patients that we are doing are also STN, but uh, sometimes when we get very, uh, side effects with STN. We have found, especially in young patients, when the side effects are, we do an STN and we find that the threshold is the side effects are more, then maybe we choose an alternate for GPA. That's what we usually do, other than the uh, in, in, in Parkinson's disease. And uh, for other indications, like Sir mentioned, when there's a predominant dystonia, very significant dyskinesia with very low dose of fibroma, there are the other indications. But by and large, for PD, mostly we look for an STN. Uh, and for other indications like dystonia, uh, of course, GPA is the option for Tourette syndrome, for uh, recent GPA, for Tourette syndrome. So GPA, mostly in non-PD indications, we go for it. One more. Uh, so if, if, uh, yeah, yeah, please tell me, sir. Yeah, uh, in some patients of young Parkinson's, we get a lot of non-motor symptoms. For example, uh, mild I prefer to uh, offer at least pyridum uh, because theoretically, STN has more non-motor symptom as compared to pyridum. Yeah, and if uh, Parkinson's disease is associated with some cognitive and psychiatric symptoms, in that, those cases, do you prefer GPI as a target? Because after STN stimulation, we know some psychiatric issues sometimes can happen. So what is your uh, kind of opinion about it? You're asking me, Amit? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, the cognitive issues in Parkinson's disease, pre dvs So, will you select? No. Uh, Personally, I feel that there is no right or wrong answer. There is no black and white. Okay. If the patient has clear cognitive and psychiatric symptoms, I would like to avoid DBS altogether. But if I have to go for it, of course, pyridum is one one target which we can discuss and we can, which we can go ahead. But there's no clear right, right or wrong answer. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. Then I will do, go to Professor Alistair Jenkins. He will talk about STN. Sir, please. All right. Two seconds. Right. Well, hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Sir. Well, thank you very much to Santosh, to Amit, and to everybody else who's made this possible. And uh, it's nice to have so many friends together. 
and thank you very much for inviting me. Millen's talk is a very difficult one to follow. I knew it would be. Um, but what I will do is, is start by saying what I say to all my trainees, which is that one size doesn't fit everybody. What I do suits me, and um, it may not suit you. And we should never stop learning. And I might say something completely different to you next year. It's also nice to be the second speaker because I don't have to rehash a lot of the stuff that, to be honest, I don't really understand. Um, and I couldn't do it as brilliantly as Melinda has done. Of all the targets for, uh, targets for Parkinson's, the STN is the smallest. And it's about the size of a grain of cooked basmati rice. And we're aiming for one third of that. As Millen said, the lateral posterior part of it, like the other nuclei, is the motor part, and that's the bit that we're looking for. So it's really quite a small target. And in addition, of course, the, the nucleus is surrounded by areas that you don't want to stimulate. Um, and you can get side effects like depression and various motor problems, and that can make things worse when you start it. So we have to get it right. And unlike some of the other targets, using an atlas is not good enough. I've actually got one or two patients who I, I should have downloaded for this, where you can see that the, the STNs are actually very asymmetrical. Often you find one is rotated and pushed forward. Uh, and so although atlas was initially used, we don't use it at all now. Now, I'm not going to go into the anatomy and physiology. I've actually removed some of those slides during, that, during the last talk. Um, because really, I can't remember it for more than five minutes, let's be honest. And also, I'm a surgeon. I do the practical things. I get feedback from my patients from the positioning of the electrodes. And it, in the end, it's what the effect is that matters to me. Um, and I'm afraid I'm, like many of us, I'm following in the footsteps of giants standing on their shoulders, and I wouldn't presume to, to interfere with the, you know, the much more important work that is done by the physiologists on the pathways. Who's suitable for subthalamic nucleus stimulation? Well, we've talked about this a bit. Um, I would say the main thing is pretty much anyone with severe Parkinson's. The younger, the better. But the classical indications are major on-off fluctuations. They have to have dopamine-responsive symptoms. STN does treat all the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's, so it's not particularly better for uh, bradykinesia, etc. There is a, a rumor that tremor is not so well treated, but I haven't found that. I've found tremor is very well treated. It's actually specifically good for the drug-related dyskinesia. I know that, that Millen said that the uh, GPI was what you want for dyskinesia, but in fact, we found the STN is very good for it. And it's not just dependent on the fact you're reducing the drugs, which of course you are. It seems specifically to target the dyskinesia. And one of the things, paradoxically, that we see when we've got a good target in the patient post-operatively is we actually see they've become a little dyskinetic for a couple of days, which is quite interesting. But they've lost their drug-related dyskinesia, so it's just a, an impact thing. We don't do it in older people. Um, they do seem a bit more prone to problems afterwards, and we do insist on an absence of uh, depressive or, or major cognitive treatments, uh, features rather. Now this is where the controversy starts. I've spent my whole career, and Ellen may remember some, a little of this, trying to reduce all operations to their bare essentials and then build them back up again, discarding all the things that are unnecessary. And this, this is controversial, but what's interesting is that more and more people are, are going towards this kind of approach. Um, I've thrown away a lot of things. I use general anesthesia throughout. I made that decision one day when I was putting on the frame and some of the very severe tremor, and one of the pins went through my thumbnail into my thumb. And after swearing a lot, I thought, okay, I'm not doing that again. I'm putting the buggers to sleep, and I have ever since. We do a three-stage procedure, which I shall uh, outline to you, but we do it in one go. First time I ever went to see one of these being done, they put the frame on the night before, put the patient to bed. The patient was lying all night in a frame. Then they took them to theater. And by the time I left at 2 p.m., they had done one side. I'm afraid I became very allergic to that sort of thing. 
We don't use image fusion. We simply use a very, very well calibrated MRI. And we're very fortunate in that we have a fantastic radiographer, what we call now a consultant radiographer, who tunes the MRI obsessively with phantoms. And we have got such good spatial resolution on this that we reckon we don't actually get any advantage from the CT. One of the advantages of being very elderly as I am is that I've been through all these phases. I have done intraoperative stimulation and monitoring. I don't do it. I don't do it for two reasons. The first one was exactly what Millen said, which was you try five or six different trajectories and you always go back to the one you first thought of, nearly always. The second one is that if you're putting very pointy things into the brain, it will come as no great surprise that that is a very good recipe for getting a hemorrhage. And we have actually had no hemorrhages at all. I shouldn't say that because it will happen next week, but so far I've had none over many, many years. Obviously, I think most people don't do a trial period. We don't, there's no point in, in the subthalamic nucleus because the effects can take quite a while to uh, manifest themselves, the beneficial effects. And we've got this down to a total anesthetic time. That's frame MRI, which is lengthy, as I'll show you in a moment, and both stages, the head and the implant, of 2.5 to 3 hours. And obviously that's good from the point of view of patient fatigue, and it's good from the point of view of infection. So the surgical procedure, these various stages, frame application, the MRI itself, positioning, always something important, draping, et cetera, um, implanting the electrodes themselves, and then completing the implant with the IPG and the extensions. Like cell frame application, well, it's one of those funny things that although it doesn't matter theoretically if you're using purely imaging based and not atlas-based coordinates, it doesn't matter what orientation you have it in. But in fact, it's a very good idea to do it the same way every time. And the same way every time, you might as well do it with what is very familiar, and that is ACPC line-based imaging. And having dutifully measured 12 and a half degrees from the orbitometrial plane, one day I realized a number of years ago that actually if you did it from the tragus to the inferior margin of the orbit, that is exactly, in nearly every patient, uh, the ACPC plane. So we put this on. I, I just do this by eyeball. I don't use ear bars or anything. Um, I find it a bit more flexible. The more symmetrically you put the head, the better it is. And for a lazy person like me, that is because you will often never have to alter uh, two out of the three coordinates. There we are with the uh, fiducials on and then and half of the, the head coil holder uh, in the MRI. And in the MRI, obviously, everything has to be non-metallic, non-ferromagnetic, uh, and this just comes as second nature once you've been doing it for a while. We just do a very high definition single mm -hmm. modality. We don't do various different modalities as, as Millen does. Um, and we find that this contiguous one millimeter slice T2 does us very well. Again, it's a sequence that's been refined over the years. It gives us very high contrast. We do axial and coronal acquisitions, and the whole thing lasts about 35 minutes, and so it's a good time to go away and have a cup of coffee or look at the rest of your patients or whatever. And here are some pictures. Um, as you can see, very good definition of the, the basal structures. Uh, this is just exactly what we use for GPI as well. We've got a two surgeon division. I do most of the, um, the STNs and uh, Claire Nicholson does uh, most of the GPIs. We happen to be married to each other, so it actually makes life very neat. Now, how do you find the, the STN? Well, um, on the axials, it's usually the, just when you're crawling out of the top of the red nucleus is the one that you select. And so there we are, uh, there. You can see it really quite nicely on both sides. You can see where uh, the GPI is being pointed out to you. So medial to that is, is the STN. And we're going for the lateral third of that. So that's our target there. Similarly, on the coronals, it's just when you're crawling out the front of the, um, the red nucleus. And so here we are. You can see the STN sitting nicely on top of the, um, the substantia nigra there. And once again, we're going for 
a lateral upper third. So the patient goes back to theatre. We complete the frame, put the arc on. I set the target as being between the middle two electrodes of a four electrode array. And that is four millimeters from the tip. Obviously you can do this either way, but I set the, the frame so that it's plus four millimeters. And that's actually really important to remember. We put the, uh, the coronal wire holes quite far laterally and just a little bit in front of the coronal suture. Uh, we put them laterally purely to avoid the, um, the ventricle, but also because it gets you more in the axis of the nucleus itself. So you're more likely to get more of your contacts in the right place. I put on the anchoring plates beforehand. I put in both screws, take one out, swivel the plate round so that I can simply swivel it on and lock it once we've got the leads in place. Open the dura one side at a time uh, for the obvious reason of not letting too much air in, as Milan said, and frequent um, irrigation will help. Again, as he said, the closer you are to the midline, the closer you are to the brainstem, the less movement artifact you're going to have from that. It's very, very important to open the dura as widely as you can within a burr hole and to coagulate and open the pia relatively obsessively. Milan talked about the weight of the microdrive pulling on the, uh, the electrode. Well, if you put in even the cannula, and it hits the dura on the way in, that's at the top of the brain level. You can imagine what the deflection of that is gonna be once you get into your target. And I've seen cases that I, I'm pretty sure that was what the problem was. So you have to make sure that your cannula is not fouling on the bone, the dura, or even on the pia. So I, I too use a cannula, I advance that to the target, it's rigid, it's not going to shift. We take an image intensifier x-ray of that and we mark the tip of the cannula. Put the electrode through that um, to a pre-marked length and then the, <laughs> the awkward bit that nobody ever seems to have managed to work out, you've done all this stuff which is accurate to a millimetre. And then somehow you have to withdraw a cannula over an electrode. Well, that's why we take the x-ray. The x-ray is completely accurate. Just don't move anything. Don't allow anybody to lean on the table or the head or whatever. Uh, so we withdraw the cannula, look at the x-ray. With the directional electrodes that we were talking about, there's an extra step there, which is you have to get them in the correct orientation so that the computer algorithm knows which way each of the segmented middle two electrodes which way it's pointing. I'll show you that in a moment. So then I lank the electrode of the plates. I put a cap on the distal end of the electrode. I tunnel those into the parietal region as far back as I can, just so that I can do a direct line down to the, uh, the subcurricular pocket. So close the wounds, remove the frame, and possibly even have another cup of coffee. And that's what it looks like. The U-shaped thing on the top of the lead there is the directional indicator. So if you've got it in that orientation, then you know that the segmented electrodes on those middle two contacts will be in the right orientation. And I'll show you something about that in a moment. I point out to you that this is two electrodes, not one. So you can see how, how accurate the whole thing is. We then redrape the patient completely, re-scrub, make an in infracolicular pocket, make a little incision over those heads of the, uh, the covers that we put on the electrodes, and we then tunnel the, that should say extensions, uh, tunnel the extensions and connect them to the IPG and to the, um, to the business end, to the electrode. Absolutely vital to test the impedances. I would say probably in at least one of 10, with a particular kit we're using at the moment, we will get faulty impedance readings. And it's nearly always just due to slight malpositioning of the electrodes and the connectors, or more often due to a little bit of blood getting on the electrodes. They are very, very sensitive. The impedances have to be as low as possible because this is something with rechargeable batteries that you hope is gonna last for 10, 15 years. 
Wounds all closed and then just about time for lunch. Post operatively, they're usually a bit stunned. Um, the shorter I've made the operation, the less invasive I've made it, the more quickly they've been waking up. It really is in the patient's best interest to keep this to a minimum. Particularly, these are patients whose brains are not well. And so the less you can do to them, the better. A day or so later, we'll do a CT scan because although we don't use image fusion for the targeting, we do use image fusion to check up on ourselves afterwards. And that's really very important. There's no point in the nurses who we have to program it messing around for weeks on end if your electrode is not in the nucleus. Especially at the moment with the COVID problems, we aim for early discharge and usually in order to leave some of the impact effects to settle, we give them about two weeks and then we bring them back in uh, to, to program. And this is really, it's one of those operations where you think the technology is doing all the work, but in fact, there's a lot of experience or feel for an operation, whatever it is, or what I like to call Zen, particularly in the targeting. You, you look at something, you go, oh, I'm not 100% sure about that. And all it is, is just pattern recognition. It's no brilliant cleverness or anything. You just think, oh, I'll just nudge that a millimeter or so laterally. Oh, I'll do that. And that's particularly the case because when we are using uh, the axial and the coronal measurements, they're never going to be exactly the same. And you have to decide which of them you prefer, which one looks better. And you average them out and then you massage them in one direction or another. And I like this because I like the art of surgery as well as the science of it. So here we are, we're looking, actually this is a bit of a fudge because this is a fusion of an epilepsy case. You can see the electrodes there. Uh, but this is the, the workstation that we use for the, for the DBS. And these are the sorts of pictures that we're looking for. We can map out the tracts, we can map out the red nucleus, we can map out the STN and the surroundings. You can see here a montage of the red nucleus, the substantia nigra. Green is the subthalamic nucleus. Um, and there they are. And here we have uh, an electrode and you can see that's nicely uh, in the nucleus going through through the thalamus there and into the into the STN. And you can see the on the STN on the left hand picture, the little brown bit, that is the um, what's the word for the simulation of the field of effect of the electrode in question. And here you can see that a bit in a bit more detail. It's this dark brown, uh, bluish, I'm a bit colorblind bit. And you can see that that electrode is in the, the dorsal lateral STN. But if we simply use that whole electrode, we'd be stimulating outside the STN. So that's where we use the segmentation to push it back in towards the, the center of the STN. You can see on the bottom um, middle, picture you can see that it is actually very nicely positioned but the field is going slightly outside as it's turned up to a certain level so what we are looking for is a nice picture on the left nice picture on the right and um, hopefully the patient will then have a, a good result and what we what is reassuring about this is you know if the patient does not have a good result it's, it's not that it's not your fault, it's just that you can ease off the idea of repositioning the electrodes because, take it from me, it doesn't work. It really doesn't help. If they're not in an optimal place, it is absolutely vital to do that and to consider doing it. And I'll leave just with a very quick video um, of before and after in someone with... Uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5... Four, three, two, one. Very, very typical Parkinson's. Worse on the right than on the left. Uh, you'll see him in a moment. Uh, this is him actually trying to do what they call in front of goose and X, that is the wide. Um, pushing together a finger and thumb. And he actually can't initiate that at all on that right side. On the left side, he can get a bit, but the excursion is really quite small. 
and then gradually they're just again making a fist. Same on the other side, a little bit better on the left as well. All his features are worse on the right. And then the thing I call on screen the light bulb, very, very slow. A little bit better on the left, but not enormously so. And then finally, foot tapping. Not too bad, not too bad. His mobility is not too bad. And then finally, we get him to cross his hands across his chest. And stand up, chief. And then stand up. There he goes. So post-operatively, this is a just over a year post-op. We say that um, you give your name. Simon Laverick. And you're one year and four months post DBS. Yeah. Right. And you're off medication at the present time. Okay. But the DBS Which is, still is quite stopped. significant. Yes. He's actually in the off state okay. right now. Just put both hands up on this one. So that tremor has completely gone. The rest tremor and intention. Finger taps this side. So improve there and then light the light bulb. And then finally up and down. See the excursion of that is much better. Sides. Okay, and pop your hands across the chest. And up your hips. So that's the sort of effect we're looking for. That's pure STN um, and obviously a very willing and a very good patient. But to be honest, that is what, what we usually get. It's a great target. Um, I hope this has been helpful in, in maybe helping some people find it. But as I said at the beginning, don't, don't trust everything I say because it may not suit you. This last picture is just to remind Melinda of what is missing not being in Newcastle anymore. So thank you very much indeed. Stop sharing my screen. There we go. Yeah, thank you, sir. Nice, very excellent presentation. So you are not doing microelectrode recording, what I see. So what is your experience regarding the, you know, the variation of the anatomy regarding the STN of different patients because well the variation doesn't matter because that, that's the whole point of doing it with guided purely by the images because yeah. if you do it with an atlas then you will you will often be miles away from the STN you could be millimeters away certainly um, but that that is the whole point of making it purely based on image that the, the the variation doesn't matter and that is really why we stopped doing it, because we realized that it wasn't helping us and it was dangerous and it made the, the operation longer. And, uh, you know, gradually more people, certainly in the UK, are coming towards that thing as well. I'm not saying I started it, but uh, uh, independently, I started that many years ago. So there are a lot of newcomers, uh, fellows and students. So do you suggest for the newcomers to do a kind of... Uh, some recording to see the outline of STN for a new I don't really think so. I, I don't think it's something you have to go through and come out the other end of it. I think it's something that we are all learning. Milan has done the same. Uh, that we, we've been through that phase. It was probably necessary at one point to hear that electronic signature of the STN, to differentiate it from the white matter tracks outside it, to know you're in the right place. But when we have such good imaging, and if you haven't got very good MRI, you can use image fusion, and that will give you exactly the same effect. Um, I, I actually, personally, I feel it's, it's not necessary anymore, and I certainly wouldn't recommend anybody went through it. I, I, I'm not a great believer in, <laughs> when, when I was training, they just brought in the uh, you know, electric training firms, but the juniors weren't allowed to use them. We had to use the Hudson Brace and the Gilles Saw. Completely pointless, completely pointless. 
but it was just the, the idea you had to go through some sort of rite of passage. And I don't think there's a rite of passage for, for uh, DBS. I think we're all in it together and we should be learning from each other. Hello, Amir. Amir. Can I ask something? Yeah, you can ask. You can ask. Uh, thank you, all the speakers, for this uh, very uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, my question to Dr. Alistair that you mentioned about uh, that uh, you are uh, using um, general anesthesia and it is for society. Hours. So I believe it is not a way at least an ayurvedic thing, or it is that. Continuous infusion used for the MRI and also for the OD. Um, what is your character? I'm not sure I really heard any. Can somebody help me with that? I don't know. I'm afraid I didn't hear the. I didn't really hear the question. There's a bit of an echo. Yes. I think Madam wanted to ask that you are doing general anesthesia, so regarding some anesthetic issues. That's oh, what right. Now, now, whether you practice your anesthesia practice awake, I think an awake patient, or, or continuous infusion all the time. Oh. Uh, well, it varies. Some of the initiates use TIVA and, and some don't. I don't think it really matters, to be honest, because we're, for this, we simply we don't need any patient cooperation. We're not doing awake, asleep, awake. We simply need the patient to be asleep, preferably. So, continuous infusion, I don't think that really makes a difference. How often you, both of you, um, just come across the um, uh, How well, if I, if I could speak first, um, it's, it's, it's not a few seconds. Pneumocephalus, pneumocephalus. How yeah. often is it um, I, I haven't had a problem with pneumocephalus myself. Uh, it, it's, very un, it's very unlikely to be a problem because well, in, in a transphenoidal, for instance, you've got a reason for it to develop and become worse. Whereas with this, you're not going to change pressure. You're not, um, there's no reason for it to get any worse if you've got some in there to begin with. I've certainly never checked for it, never really noticed any problems with it. What do you think, Melind? Yeah, I agree with you. I, I never had any symptomatic pneumocephalus or a large pneumocephalus. I think uh, not a surgery where you get you know, pneumocephalus. Uh, never had a problem with it. And to both of you, uh, I'll ask what is your experience uh, in DBS uh, in chronic refractory pain syndrome? DBS in? I think, Madam, we have uh, Dr. Milin Sanke also. We'll uh, hear about different targets and then we'll discuss about uh, all these questions. Because uh, Dr. Milin Sanke also will discuss about the targets. But experience with pain, with pain. They have done uh, in um, PD patients in uh, dystonia, but uh, what about pain, chronic pain? How many okay. patients they have done and their experience? Um, certainly, my, my experience of DBS and chronic pain is not good. Uh, and in fact, there's only one unit in the UK that still does any of it at all. Uh, and I'm not very impressed with their results either. What about you, Milind? It's complex. Uh, we, did, we did different targets, and I think Milind Sanke will speak about it. But uh, periaqueductal grain, peri, uh, peri, all those areas, VCVS, we did thalamus, we did CL, doesn't help. Really, pain is not something that's, uh, that's ingrained in uh, network. It's just perception. Uh, so doesn't help. Well, we'll now hear from Dr. Milin Sanke. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent presentations. Let thank us hear from next Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, thank you Amit uh, and uh, 
nice to see Melinda and uh, my namesake and uh, Alistair. I must admit that uh, my uh, initial experience with DBS was a little north of Newcastle, starting in uh, Dundee with uh, Mr. Varma uh, being of the first person to introduce me to uh, this. So the way I'm going to uh, discuss this is to essentially give a brief about uh, the targets which have already been discussed. Uh, then probably talk a bit more on uh, other targets such as uh, VIM and VOA. Uh, some uh, discussion on uh, PPN and probably finish it finish it off with a few examples. I presume that my slides are well visualized and uh, I'm pretty well heard. I have no disclosures as such. Are my slides well visualized, Amit? Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, Luckily, as I'm, uh, I'm the third speaker, so there are many things which have been covered, and uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, I don't have to necessarily cover uh, everything that uh, has been done so far. But uh, there would always be some degree of overlap, and some of these overlaps would uh, be with the GPI, some would be with the STN. So I would go about starting with a few conditions, uh, then targets, uh, methods of targeting, which would be focused primarily on imaging. Uh, unlike what Alistair mentioned, and uh, I think uh, Milind has uh, also probably reduced his uh, use of MER, uh, we continue to use MER, and uh, though not necessarily out of uh, you know altering the trajectory as such, but uh, the um, you know as a matter of habit with my neurologist uh, always wanting to do the MER and checking it with the neurophysiology. Uh, you'll see that uh, I always do post-operative MRI scan and there may be some uh, discussion on that considering that uh, I do the MRI scan between uh, stage one and stage two which is all in the same day so essentially the procedure starts roughly at about 8 a.m. in the morning and uh, we're done with uh, everything by about half past four all in one day. This obviously being the fact that uh, I work in a setup where I, I have to make sure that the theater time and the hospital time is reduced for the patient as much as possible. The patients are hospitalized the day before with uh, all the uh, checkups done before with the pre-operative MRI scan done on outpatients basis as well. And uh, the patients are discharged on about day four after surgery to follow up in the outpatients clinic uh, roughly at about 10 days uh, uh, from the date of procedure. Obviously, I'll end with a few examples and uh, to have at the end some questions. So some of the uh, things have been discussed and uh, I'll take the opportunity to discuss a bit about uh, uh, ventroralis anterior and ventroralis posterior, something about the uh, VIM and then something for PPN. I have uh, restricted myself to these four rather than uh, going into OCDs or epilepsy because the targets can be very variable. And I have not uh, got much experience on uh, DBS for pain. Um, and I must admit that I did uh, uh, show interest in the beginning to uh, do DBS for pain, but was uh, quickly dissuaded by the um, my mentor, Mr. Varma. And then uh, I spoke to, I did spend some time with Tipu Aziz as well at uh, Oxford that time in those days when I was a trainee in the UK. And uh, uh, he was a little inspirational, but I eventually didn't get convinced to do anything with pain. Um, the coming to the imaging modalities, though there have been multiple uh, uh, studies in the past with uh, and uh, surgeries with ventriculography, and uh, but MRI remains the gold standard. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, talk about using higher uh, Tesla MRI scan, but I completely agree with uh, what Milan said earlier regarding uh, uh, increase in the charge, uh, chances of distortion and uh, 
So uh, I still stick to 1.5 Tesla MRI scan, though I have a three Tesla MRI scan. And uh, I have a couple of cases with three Tesla MRI scan, though I must admit that I wasn't, uh, there wasn't much difficulty with it, but uh, I still managed to, you know, because getting an access to 1.5 Tesla MRI scan is much easier for me. And I, as I said, I do two MRI scans uh, within a span of 24 hours. So it helps me out with that. Uh, so coming to targeting as such, uh, we uh, have the, heard this, such as anatomical targeting, which includes a direct targeting. Then there is an indirect targeting, which is the anterior commissure, posterior commissure based, atlas based, uh, as far as the STN is concerned, using the red nucleus as a targeting method or a targeting tool. And obviously the physiological targeting, including MER and neurophysiology as a methodology. And I go on to discuss uh, one of the things which we initially tried as far as uh, DPI is concerned as well. So um, as uh, Alistair mentioned, uh, uh, I uh, too uh, started off uh, with uh, my um, experience in the DBS with uh, Awake, and uh, but I was uh, quickly forced on to doing it uh, with uh, general anesthesia, particularly in children. For some reason, the amount of work that came to us for dystonia was uh, significantly higher. And as one can understand, uh, we started off my uh, dystonia work started off way back in 2002, where I had to do uh, emergency pallidotomy for a child who came in status dystonicus and uh, had to do it under general anesthesia. And way back in those days, uh, um, but, uh, you know, whether you do it under general anesthesia or local anesthesia, I think the uh, basic principles remain the same and uh, I have continued to use uh, the uh, guidance with uh, imaging as well as electrophysiology and uh, neurophysiology and I'll go on to show and discuss a few uh, uh, show a few videos along which I can essentially show how we do neurophysiological monitoring under general anesthesia as well. So this is a typical MR acquisition of an STN and uh, each I believe that each center has to uh, develop its own protocol and it's the fairly standardized protocol which you need to tweak around for your machine but otherwise it's quite simple to see an STN and similarly it is uh, quite uh, simple to see uh, GPI as well. This was uh, some of the work which was published in 2000, way back in 2006 with the use of three Tesla MRI scan but as I said use of three Tesla MRI scan is something which is uh, available, but not necessarily something which I opt for. Um, use of uh, MRI directly for GPI targeting is something which has uh, been extensively discussed uh, by Milan in the previous talk. And as he specifically mentioned, the uh, try and stick to the posterior ventral lateral pallidum if you're thinking in, in terms of the motor GPI, if you're looking for something more with uh, looking for psychic uh, effects, then you're probably better off being in the anterior GPI. And this was uh, the, to the right lower corner, you can see the paper which was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery, where the uh, breaking down of the GPI as such into four quadrants and trying to uh, you know, make sure that your electrodes are placed at the junction of the third and the fourth. So uh, it's quite uh, easy to try and uh, target the GPI uh, and the STN using direct uh, MRI acquisition. And uh, uh, it's something which is now the standard practice, I think, across. And MRI has become the most important tool as far as the target acquisition is concerned. Uh, a brief word about what uh, um, Lynn was showing earlier regarding the use of uh, uh, the optic tract and uh, the uh, path specimen to the right upper corner essentially shows the relationship of the GPI, which is within about three to five millimeters dorsal to the um, uh, optic tract. And 
unlike what Milin mentioned, I come is almost a straight end on trajectory and uh, try and hit the, what is the lateral edge, not exactly the lateral edge, but either the optic track or the lateral edge of the optic track is what I'm looking at and just uh, stick stay about three millimeters uh, dorsal to it. So in the very first experiment that uh, in the very first case that we did, uh, we uh, this was in the very early days where we were still uh, aware of the relationship, but we didn't really have uh, a very, very uh, lot of comfort in uh, you know, using the GPI as a direct access, and we didn't really have good MER recordings as uh, our personal experience uh, of the GPI. So we then tried, and I'm sure uh, all of us over here are aware of the paper we just published using flash over potentials to try and uh, 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 target the GPI and staying and trying to uh, delay the latency by uh, internally stimulating. And it was quite an experience because uh, we started off uh, in the morning, but we essentially landed up trying to get some outcomes and results. It took us almost about two and a half to three years to eventually reach a conclusion and that's what we gave up the idea of But that does not reduce the importance and the relationship as such to the optic tract. And uh, the one important way of targeting is to essentially track your optic tract, uh, track the visual uh, optic tract and uh, try and uh, reach the lateral border and essentially uh, in the coronal plane be about three millimeters dorsal to the GPI. Why is so much of talk on the GPI? Because I completely agree with the fact that uh, GPI is uh, a very excellent target for multiple conditions. That does not include only dystonia, it includes uh, uh, Parkinson's as well. And uh, to answer one of the questions which was asked after Milan's talk, which Rishikesh was uh, asked about. Uh, the, I prefer GPI when it comes to patients who have some degree of uh, depression, which is uh, some non-motor symptoms in patients who have Parkinson's disease or patients who have suicidal tendencies. It's probably better to use GPI in such cases in Parkinson's disease rather than STM. Uh, for all that is worth, we know that uh, we may not be able to bring down the medications much after a GPI stimulation in Parkinson's, but sure enough, the chances of patient developing any sort of uh, non-motor symptoms after STN stimulation are much higher than with the GPI stimulation. So having said briefly about uh, the uh, direct targeting, uh, for VIM and for that matter in uh, uh, other targets such as uh, ventroralis anterior VOVAP VO, junction as such, we do not have uh, any sort of direct targeting available as yet. So one needs to rely heavily on the understanding of uh, our uh, topography and the use of uh, the atlases as such. So this is uh, something which one needs to try and understand, trying to break and understand the anatomical correlation uh, and the importance of the ACPC plane and the relationship of the STN, the VIM and the GPI to the mid commissural point. And quite important to remember that, uh, I'll try and uh, put it up here as well. So, to uh, realize that uh, the GPI is a target which is closer to the AC, the STN is very much in the MCP uh, proximity, whereas the VIM is close to the uh, PC as such, or just behind the MCP. Uh, so these are the standard coordinates which are available in most of the, uh, and this, this has been available for quite some time, and uh, there's not much of debate as to what uh, uh, has been discussed so far. And uh, uh, I uh, would uh, more or less follow the same uh, coordinates which have been suggested here. Uh, this is just to try and uh, uh, show the uh, use of uh, Atlas uh, in the indirect targeting and just to highlight the importance of 
uh, understanding of the relationship uh, of these nuclei uh, to the internal capsule, uh, including the use of uh, VOA and VOP junction as you go from anterior to posterior. So uh, again, as I said, uh, coming to the use of targets, uh, here one needs to realize the uh, use of uh, the uh, uh, ACPC. And uh, the target that I, the coordinates that I use for uh, VOA or VOP are essentially uh, what has been uh, uh, used by many, many uh, neurosurgeons across the globe is 15 millimeters lateral, just about uh, uh, zero to two or almost uh, right uh, in close proximity to the MCP if I'm looking at VOA and just about a couple of millimeters behind if I'm looking at VOP. And if I'm thinking in terms of VIM, I'm just about uh, five to six millimeters behind the MCP. Obviously everything is a little dorsal to, everything is about a millimeter dorsal to the ACP steep plane. So, um, having discussed this, I'm going to uh, sh uh, sh share some examples, but before I do that, uh, uh, I'm going to show a couple of videos uh, for uh, patients with uh, PSP. And uh, this, is a, this is a gentleman with a very advanced uh, PSP. Mr. Vikram, uh, look at to your right side. Uh, okay. You follow this finger, come on. So here uh, one okay. can make out that uh, the patient has uh, severe more, uh, more look at your right side. Uh, gaze paresis, uh, or rather, uh, and uh, he has. He just couldn't walk without any support whatsoever. This is the case with advanced PSP. Your left side. And as we all know, it's not going to be too long before. Uh, uh, and this is someone who is in the early stages of PSP, uh, and uh, they're not too bad in the early stages of PSP. And why do I bring this into discussion just now? Is because um, PPN as a target for gait has uh, been extensively worked upon. And we've had a couple of uh, cases where we've had, you know, we've had some experience of using PPN as the target. I'll uh, try and show what uh, we've used as a target. This is something which is again available. Uh, both these individuals, uh, this particular individual did well and he, uh, this was, uh, this gentleman was done way, both were done in about 2015. The advanced PSP gentleman didn't really do well and we uh, continued to monitor him with the gate analysis at uh, three months and uh, then uh, six months and at a year, but there was not much change despite uh, variable settings in the stimulation. Whereas uh, the gentleman who's uh, on the screen just now, he did pretty well. And, uh, but as unfortunately, as we all know, at about uh, three years, uh, sorry, two years for the initial and the previous individual and for about uh, four years for this individual, they both passed away. Uh, so this is what I uh, used for uh, uh, choosing the PPN and uh, this is at the uh, this is the MRI scan acquisition uh, using the proton density imaging, and this is at the inferior colliculus level. And uh, the region of the PPN, I, I'm not sure whether my uh, cursor would be visible, but uh, uh, just about uh, uh, okay. I'm struggling to use my cursor, but. Uh, never mind. Over here in the right lower corner where you are essentially seeing the uh, some degree of uh, periaqueductal gray matter which is hyper intense on uh, uh, proton density just about lateral to that and uh, is the area of the PPN and further lateral to it is the uh, essentially hypo intense uh, uh, lateral lemniscus and the spinal lemniscus, which you're seeing. Uh, the uh, upper, upper boundary of the 
hole of your electrode is at the level of the inferior colliculus and where you, whereas the lower margin is roughly at the BF plane, that is the plane uh, using the fastigial point. Um, having said this, uh, this is all about uh, using imaging as a modality for targeting, but this is not the only thing that we rely upon. Uh, the, we've had uh, excellent uh, experience as far as using electrophysiology is concerned as across most of the surgeons and the neurologists across the globe. And we've relied heavily on this uh, in the initial days, but as uh, Alistair and Milan also stressed, generally after a certain experience, your uh, initial target chosen, which is very much the anatomical target and the trajectory is generally proven right, which uh, for STN, we are still using about four contacts at least uh, for uh, GPI, uh, we have uh, boiled down to using just about uh, one uh, microelectrode and uh, initial stages we started off with three, but now we've just uh, uh, selected down to one. Though I do put the thing, uh, the cannulae and the macroelectrode all the way, uh, or at least a couple of millimeters short, uh, just to try and make sure that I don't get any trajectory shift. So our use of microelectrode uh, recordings has been quite extensive and we've never had difficulty in trying to acquire these. And these are the standard STN uh, microelectrode recordings which have been, uh, and to the right is an SMR recording. This is something which we always try and acquire. We acquire the STN, we acquire the SMR, and then using this, we, uh, as suggested by Milan, we we'll try and stick to the dorsolateral STN when it comes to the STN and about uh, posterior pallidum when it comes to the uh, GPI for motor GPI, obviously, and staying about two millimeters over two to three millimeters away from the boundary of the internal capsule. But staying as ventral as possible, trying to get uh, as, as close proximity to the unsalient anticularis as possible. So uh, this is something which is uh, long published in uh, uh, 2002. Uh, talking of our experience with uh, the GPI uh, and microelectrode recordings, we've had uh, a very similar experience as what uh, Milin discussed. And uh, uh, we, were very, very, we were very, very comfortable trying to uh, get uh, microelectrode recordings in the GPE as seen here using the pause burst pattern. But I would like to reaffirm what uh, Melin said, you need to essentially get your boundaries right and you should be able to see the transition from a GPE to a GPI and you can see the difference between a pause burst pattern to a continuous burst. Uh, and we've had uh, quite satisfactory um, uh, placement of electrodes using microelectrode recordings. Yes. But we don't end uh, just there. We go on to do neurophysiology as well. We've had similar experience with the VIM as uh, our uh, target as well. And we've managed to uh, elicit similar recordings. So I must admit that our uh, 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 I don't, at the moment, I cannot really show you a recording of the uh, microelectrode recordings from the VOA VOP junction, but they're more or less the same. Uh, we don't stop here. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, the uh, uh, my neurologist is quite uh, keen on uh, insisting upon uh, electrophysiology and neurophysiology, for which I'm pretty glad because it essentially means that it's a combined uh, decision for everything that we do, including the target to be chosen and uh, the trajectory. And uh, the role of neurologist in the theater has to be uh, something which cannot be really downplayed. So here, this video that is playing is a young girl who is under general anesthesia, and we are trying to uh, determine the proximity. She's been, she's off paralyzing agent. And this is one of our earlier cases. And uh, we used uh, 
the uh, macro stimulation to try and induce uh, capsular uh, effects uh, after turning off the paralyzing agent uh, by obviously uh, by increasing the uh, current output there. And this, the other video is obviously uh, someone who is wired away and he's just being tested. And so something which is active and something which is passive. So we try and ensure that we combine all these. And uh, here comes probably something which uh, I'm not sure whether everybody would agree to, but I've been doing an MRI scan post-operative even way before this was given clearances uh, by the company as either whether you call it Medtronic in the earlier days or for that matter, St. Jude's or Abbott as it is now or uh, Boston Scientific. So we've been uh, acquiring post-operative MRI scans uh, right from the beginning. Uh, I don't have an intraoperative MRI scan or an OAM, but I always do an intraoperative MRI scan. Uh, it is, I just uh, have to shift the patient to a couple of levels below, but we are, uh, it is so, such a well-oiled mechanism is that our uh, turnover time from the uh, stage one to stage two is roughly around 45 minutes to an uh, at max about uh, an hour, but it's generally about less than that. And this, it takes 45 minutes from the time we've confirmed the electrode placement, uh, uh, from after we've done the, confirmed the electrode placement using neurophysiological monitoring and confirmed it with the II. And uh, once we have uh, anchored the electrodes, the scalp is just closed in a single layer with the pockets created. And uh, I go on to anchor the electrodes to the skull using uh, a simple uh, two hold uh, uh, titanium uh, micro plates uh, to make sure that they don't move apart from the anchoring devices which are available from the company. And uh, it's a very routine thing to do, uh, whether it is an STN or whether it is a GPI or for that matter, whether it is a pallidotomy. And as you can see in all these images over here, we go on to acquire these standard images uh, across yes. and we Just uh, perfect. check perfect. it yeah. each time uh, uh, using the navigation software. And uh, we check not only uh, our, uh, our DBS uh, electrode, but we go on to check our uh, uh, lesioning as well. So this is one such example for someone who's uh, been, uh, uh, who's undergone a VOA thalamotomy for rital scrap. Um, coming now to the examples, and uh, this is the same example of the uh, uh, young teacher who uh, has uh, had severe rital cramp, and this is now almost about uh, if I'm not wrong, this must be at least around five and a half years ago, five and a half to six years ago. And this is something which is, as you can see, is, uh, uh, this was obviously done under local anesthesia. It's a unilateral uh, lesioning. And uh, he is quite comfortable in writing and he's been eternally grateful for the same. Uh, Coming to some other examples, uh, this is a gentleman who's been operated almost now eight years ago. These are some different indications. This is not dystonia, these are dyskinesias, these are tardive dyskinesias. As you can see, this gentleman uh, has been a national wrestling champion. These tardive dyskinesias made it help for him. And uh, he came to us at the end of about four years after having gone through this. And uh, um, this was our initial experience of using uh, four electrodes. Uh, one may question as to why did we need to use four electrodes. We weren't exactly sure about whether we would be able to get um, a good benefit. This was our very first uh, um, uh, case of such uh, bad tardive dyskinesias. And uh, he has had uh, two battery changes since then. 
Uh, his two contacts, which are both in the Thalamai, have uh, not been ever used. He's just on bilateral GPI stem. And you can see immediately post op he's, he's completely recovered. Um, his, uh, he did continue to have some effects, and we had to, as uh, Milan was suggesting earlier, um, we had to change the current output. And this is a few years down the line as well. He still has some uh, uh, effects, uh, but now it's been almost about uh, two battery changes. He's now on to a rechargeable battery. And uh, okay. following which he's also gone, undergone a lumbar spine surgery. He's luckily back to himself. And he's pretty glad that this is now over for him. Obviously, he needs to continue. He needs to have bilateral GPI stimulation for so many years to gone past. Um, another uh, such example of a tardive dystonia. This is a young lady. Uh, I operated on this... Uh, lady in, uh, I was asked to proctor this case in Tehran. That was my, this was my, uh, I think, first visit in Tehran. And uh, uh, I was stunned when I saw this case. I had never seen something like this. Um, I saw her at the initial visit and then I planned this case uh, at the next visit, if I'm not wrong. And we went on to do this. And again, it was uh, posterior ventral lateral pallidum. Uh, why, why do I say that is because I still love GPI as the target for many, many things. And this is her. This is her uh, within a week after uh, and she was uh, generally grateful for having seen, being able to see the flow. Um, is GPI uh, um, Still a favorite target for me. The answer to that is simply yes. And uh, this is a young lady who uh, had a cavernoma which had bled. And uh, she, uh, this was a thalamic cavernoma which bled. And following, uh, she underwent surgery for the same. And she developed severe uh, hemibilismus. Oh, I haven't put the... <laughs> So both the videos are post-op. I'll have to essentially switch and show the uh, uh, hemibilismus video, which I will at the end of my presentation. So this is that uh, this is a young uh, girl who underwent a unilateral pallidotomy, and uh, I'll show you the pre-operative uh, video as well once we are finished with the last slide. So um, just to uh, 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 you know, sum it up, uh, we work in a team and uh, I'm uh, lucky to have uh, not just a neurologist, but I have a very interested uh, nurse as well who just focuses on movement disorder work. And obviously, uh, I'm glad to have patients and their relatives who are extremely supportive for the, uh, obviously with their gains in mind, but uh, with supporting the program as well. I'll just uh, briefly uh, uh, acquire my uh, the hemibilismus video and uh, I'll just uh, put it across. Just give me a minute or so. Okay, so uh, 
so i'll just uh, play this video so this is the uh, stigia hemiplegicus following the surgery and uh, obviously you've seen the post operative video before though uh, it is slightly related to the size of the lesion that one makes we over a uh, period have started realizing that uh, you know, the in india there is a significant uh, still a role for lesioning as such and though i i have uh, i do a lot of stn work for parkinson's disease but uh, pallidotomy is something which i uh, am getting more and more inclined to uh, for various indications including some dopa induced dyskinesia as well thank you for your attention thank you sir very nice presentation uh, you are doing lesioning so what modality you are using it is the focused ultrasound or it is uh, radio frequency uh no 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 i uh i have complete realization of the fact that uh, i work in a private setup where i will have to justify a lot of uh, uh, my investments and i cannot afford a mr guided focus trap so no it's a straight forward rf lesioning so i use a standard lexel neuro generator and try and stick to uh, making sure that uh, uh minimal cost is what is necessary we can't really afford an mr guided focus trap so i know that i work in a big hospital and then uh, there is no shortage of money but eventually we will have to do some uh explanation of the equipment that we buy yes and you need some ppn stimulation for psp is that what we can see so yes yeah uh, Yes, it is a very crippling condition. What is your overall experience at doing this uh, ESP? Because we don't get much ESP patients for stimulation, so um, you have a lot of experience. So, what is your opinion regarding ESP? And I will um, ask Dr. Rishikesh and Dr. Dibbe also regarding this ESP. Uh, what is the neurological perspective about uh, ESP? Uh, stimulation. Yeah, because, uh, PSP. We are uh, PSP. We see a lot, and unfortunately, we see more often PSP as compared to what we see in uh, other setup. The reason is that we are a referral center, and uh, the PSP patient keeps on coming. Personally, I feel that uh, this is a very difficult condition, and uh, I won't uh, go for a DBS. the reason is that overall the prognosis is not good despite dbs the things are going to worsen so it may give improvement uh, for for a small um, period of time how much functional that improvement will be difficult to say because what we measure and what the patient's function status is there may be discordance so to me ppn dbs that has come and still uh, it's not holding it its feet the new targets coming up like recently only 2 months back in frontiers the cuneiform nucleus was one of the target that was touted in animal models cuneiform nucleus again is gate generator in midbrain so we'll wait for that but personally i'm not at this point in time i'm not very enthusiastic about subjecting psp for dbs divya yeah yes sir i agree with you totally because uh, most of our psp patients has so much disabled and if the surgery is going to help them for like hardly 5 6 months it would not be worthwhile to undergo such a big surgery and otherwise most of our patients even patients who are uh, uh, the patients who are otherwise subjected to dbs even those who have a baseline post sensitivity most of them was like even if they have mild symptoms they really was an after the surgery so we really are not at this point at least confident enough to go forward with a dbs for a phase so in in those cases madam what was the target it was a stn or uh, it was a ppn in no we have not attempted a ppn in any patient till now but uh, i think even in the studies which they have shown ppn has not really showed a remarkable difference there were some benefits in the early stages but uh, they were not uh, 
really uh, long standing effect that's why they look for other targets even this uniform the, the one which has recently uh, come to us back when they have just started doing it they they hope that that may be the one which is responsible given that uniform helps in the initiation of gate run as compared to union but uh, we have to wait and see if uniform gives us good results like even in those patients uh, like if it really gives good results maybe in pd we might attempt but psp still given the long term prognosis is not being so good uh, i'm not sure if patients would agree in, I mean, for a short term improvement because they are disabled by so many other things the cognition the fall and so many other things so what it would translate into is not really sure yeah so it's the advice yes sir one needs to understand that ppn as a target is something which is predominantly explored for gait rather than uh, yeah absolutely sir one needs to understand that psp as such everyone realizes that uh, you are talking about a limited life span with the whole thing being trying to enhance the quality of life and uh, uh, we as such we have a very limited experience as well so ppn most of the centers across the globe would also have very limited experience for psp but ppn as a target and a cuneiform nucleus as well is essentially being looked at trying to support the lack of improvement in gait in patients with parkinson's disease so ppn as a target may be further worked upon and will continue to be worked upon according to me because it is uh, gate uh, issues or uh, with uh, stn continue to remain and uh, probably it would be uh, a matter of time before uh, ppn for gate which has a lot of work has been done particularly by tipu and uh, many other many other centers for ppn but you know, one one does not discard the target ppn as such but psp everybody realizes that it is not something which uh, is not it's obviously a limited life span and the utility value for dbs particularly in our setup in the india it's likely to be yeah, it's nice to see the post operative things yes i mean ppn uh, as melin rightly said is a gait target i mean it is not specific to psp I mean, we haven't done any psp previous ppn itself alone also is not it's a mr for target it's not like stn there is no clear cut bound law boundaries and we did and we didn't get very good benefit so recently we started a trial of spinal cord stimulation in people with primary gait problems primary freezing or gait problem dependent parkinson's disease and that works much better uh ppn works well if you do it with stn so you do both stn leads everything improves gait doesn't improve then you put two ppn leads but that's too much of undertaking it's better just to put in a spinal cord stimulator and then um, let them walk so that's exactly the point dr million that gait a uh, single target is very difficult to ascertain because we all know subcortical area ppn brain stem the spinal target has been tried and there is no single target at this point in time regarding gait uh, stimulation uh, uh, spinal cord stimulation mandar jog has published from canada only a uh, one and a half year back with positive result that was followed by another study from toronto with negative result so spinal cord stimulation i don't know how much it will work but there's no because this gait is not responding to anything so why not keep on trying and pegging in that some something may work a yeah, lot of targets gradually coming and came coming into our new targets are there so i am very it is very nice to see post operative videos of dr milin sanke in psp patient how they improves so that is why i am very interested i think amit i think amit you are getting it wrong i have not said that the psp patients improve we i try to show ppn as the ppn area as the target for patients with uh, gait abnormalities both these patients the first patient who was shown who was in the advanced psp actually succumbed within a couple of years so uh, one needs to understand that psp is a major limitation to the life span for sure uh, eventually at the end of 2 years the patient uh, you know 
despite the psp the progression continued with the initial marginal improvement and which is very very difficult to ascertain apart from gait analysis and we did manage to show some benefit on gait analysis but that was very limited uh, and in the second patient as well he was not a very advanced psp so one can clearly say that whether the patient really had, <coughs> had significant benefit or not there was improvement from the gait analysis point of view to a degree but again this was to varying stimulation settings over a period of uh, you know 6 uh, months to a year and then at the end of about 3 and a half years or 4 years if i may get the if i am not getting the uh, if i am not making a mistake as far as the time uh, time period is concerned the patient did succumb so i know for a fact that this patient died in 2019 and i also remember a fact that this patient was operated in uh, october 2015 so you know the progression for psp is 100% and time limitation is 100% so psp as a target has limitations but that does not rule out ppn as the uh, uh, psp as an indication is not a great indication but ppn as a target is something which needs to be worked upon and probably will be worked upon in the future yeah absolutely and sir what is your experience in psychiatric diseases like uh, obsessive compulsive disorder the dbs in so um, i i have i have purposely not included ocds uh, i have an ex, uh, i have personally got about uh, uh, eight cases of uh, ocd for whom i have operated upon uh, but i i have not done dbs for these uh i have essentially done lesioning for these and why do i uh, specify this clearly is uh, and why did i not include because this was essentially about dbs and i didn't want to hijack the meeting with uh, uh, lesioning as a methodology but clearly uh, why do i believe in lesioning because it is uh, uh less expensive dbs for uh, ocd i will have to keep changing the battery because the usage of battery is pretty high and uh, my patients are not prepared for it and most of these patients are young patients one of my patients was just about 16 years old one of them was an mbbs uh, uh, student who uh, uh, these have all most of these have undergone uh, anterior capsulotomy as the this uh, one patient has uh, had Uh, lesioning using an rf generator but i have uh, restricted myself to doing lesioning for ocds and uh, luckily i would say you know apart from one patient the first, very first initial patient who didn't do so well most of them have had significant benefits on the vibox scale uh, the um, but as i said you know i have restricted myself to doing lesioning most of them with uh, use of gamma knife and uh, one patient with uh, rf uh, lesioning okay dbs for psychiatric disorder samit uh, you do it in uh, generally done in four indications one is uh, depression other is ocd third one is a neuropsychiatric disease tourets and fourth one we doing a trial on addiction uh, so for ocd it's well documented It's good anterocapsular DBS uh, or lesion, as Mirindo was saying. It's good. Um, lesions are better because OCD patients are OCD patients, and they twirl the leads and they twirl the batteries, and uh, the hardware gets into complication. Uh, we got a large series of OCD. Depression is somewhere in between. So we were part of the reclaim study, in the, which is uh, putting a DBS in uh, ventral striatum, ventral uh, um, ventral capsule. and then helen mayberg's area 25 study both dbss give you some benefit uh, i would say about 40 50% benefit but patients have to be really really terminal multiple ecgs multiple uh, medications suicide attempts and all those things um gives you about 40 50% benefit uh, and you have to stimulate with large 8 9 volts so we really don't know what we are stimulating but we stimulate there so your uh, thalamic target ventral walls uh, it's very good or even uh, ventral striatum target works well gpi 
addiction we are now uh, again using ventral striatum uh, we did the same in obesity where we thought uh, obesity is food addiction so we are stimulating ventral striatum all these when when you venture out of motor system everything becomes gray in motor system everything is black and white there is tremor there is no tremor it's not like that in psychiatric dbs in dbs for pain these are uh, uh, there are a lot of perceptions there are a lot of uh, other uh, networks limbic networks and networks and all those networks involved so it becomes very muddled so uh, i think initially if you are starting to do dbs don't venture in any of these things uh, just stick to the movement disorders to begin with so if i can actually just add to what milan is saying completely agree with uh, this particular part as to you know uh, the non motor indications for uh, any form of uh, uh, movement disorder surgery is a little gray area i'm not to say that the, these don't work they do work but uh, you know please do not start with non motor indications definitely um and some of these i i i remember doing a vagus nerve stimulation for and i'm sure milan would probably recollect as well this particular young lady who is who flew down from canada to come to see me and uh, get a vagus nerve stimulation done and this was for depression and she was jumping around after a vagus nerve stimulation and i couldn't figure out why why did she get better to be honest i had no reason to believe that she was better because of the vagus nerve stimulation and it was such a subjective thing i have not been uh, convinced about it uh, for uh, quite a few psychiatric indications ocd pretty good very 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 happy with ocd uh, at least i can uh, you know have some and but as i said i stick to lesioning i do not have any exposure for uh, doing anything apart from ocd i've i've always wanted to do tourettes and uh, unluckily uh, the patients uh, didn't uh, fructify to the table as such yes okay thank you sir and lastly i come to dr dipya and dr rishikesh regarding the programming because ultimately we have to program the dbs so post operatively how will you advise patient and how will you start programming for a you know patient who had a dbs with for parkinson's disease how will you start it will you divya can you start please then i'll start actually uh, we start we do the entire battery as well as the I mean, implantation in the first go in a single setting and what we usually do is after around 3 to 4 days we first see the patient in the, in the battery is not switched on uh, after an overnight withdrawal of levodopa uh, we start we take the patient for programming they assess in the off stage what is the level because we need to know see whether there are any lesioning effects there can be an improvement in the symptoms uh, in the rigidity as well as uh, radicalization as part of the lesioning effect itself so we document that and then we also look for any dyskinesias which could be there as part of lesioning and then we look at the impedance that's the first thing we need to look at so we look at the impedance if because there uh, there can be some hardware related problems initially so these days actually one of the after one of the patient had a hardware related problem what we do is the first time we check impedance in the uh, ot itself immediately after implantation we check the impedance first time to make sure that there is no hardware related issues on table and then subsequently again when we start programming we check the impedance and to see if there are any problems with the electrodes so if the impedance is clear what we do is we check each electrode by electrode it is checked so we keep the uh, in a pulse width at uh, 60 microsecond and a frequency of 130 hertz and each electrode by electrode we check from above downwards and then you we assert you we increase it in terms of maybe 0.1 to 0.5 volts and as certain what is the improvement that we are seeing so rigidity is one of the most important things that we can go by because uh, tremor and radicalization may not be like immediate kind of effects but if you have a rigidity that may be very forthcoming tremor may be variable so we look at what is the response that we get and also the adverse effects if there are any so at each point and what is the maximum tolerance we document that so that we know which is the best uh, contact with a good therapeutic window that is the adverse effects are less as well as uh, we have the best stimulation so like that we check on both sides 
and then we keep it on an electrode which has the maximum therapy the adverse effects are minimal and then where you get the maximum effect so initially we keep it at a very low voltage like 1.5 to 2 volts on either side or depending on the asymmetry and then we give the first dose of levodopa and also then monitor the patient by around one to two hours to see what is the uh, after programming with stim on and medication on what is the improvement whether there are any dyskinesias yes. so the initial uh, part it may be a bit complicated sometimes in certain patients who have dyskinesias there can be some problem but uh, most of the patients do well in the like in the initial programming itself we get to know what is because we do an mer quite frequently so we have seen that most of the time if there are no intrap adverse effects it's fairly is uh, fairly fast so with that and they do fine so that's how we initially program then if there are any uh, other side effect that the patient is facing you may we may reduce or change the voltage uh, of the stimulation and then we do a reassessment at maybe 3 uh, months usually but if there are any other if the difficulty so the patient he can come back early because once the lesioning starts worsening uh, they may have some changes in the stimulation so also they are taught about the patient programmer as well as how to do it themselves with the programmer that is available to them so certain changes in the voltages and those certain initial things they can do it by themselves once they are used to it and if there is any issue in the initial period they can always come back or contact us over the phone and we let them know so that is how usually we go ahead with the initial programming yes thank you ma'am and there is some questions from the audiences we will go to the chat box and uh, There is a question. Importance of deep brain stimulation, Dr. Deepak Das. What is the coordinates for thalamic stimulation? Probably we have already discussed the coordinates of thalamic stimulation. And there are a lot of questions actually. Uh, one question is from Dr. Anwar Ul Haq. riyad from riyad he was asking about indications of dbs i think dr sanke has discussed about and we have discussed about all the indications about dbs dr k mohesh we, we could sorry to interrupt we could answer the question perhaps about thalamic dbs sir in the chat box you can see some questions and the chat box No, no. I, I'm, I'm saying that there was a question you said about thalamic TBS, and and I'm sure we could we could maybe address that. Yeah, go ahead, Alistair. Oh no, no. After you, Milan. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you told me about thalamic TBS. Do you remember uh, that I was walking in your office? And you were sitting in the office with your bicycle next to you, and you told me if you go between eleven and thirteen, you will never go wrong. <laughs> that was one of the things you told me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! You've got too good a memory. You have, Melody. You really have. Um, well, basically, thalamic DBS is where many of us started, and I certainly started with it. And it's extremely good for benign essential tremor. I think it's a mistake. I, I used to use it as a target for tremor dominant Parkinson's. but that was because of that myth that i mentioned earlier on was that gpi and uh, stn were not as good now that may be true up to a point although as you saw in that video i showed it can still be very very good um there are two two problems there firstly it's probably not a great idea for parkinson's because the other effects will catch up with you in the end and we actually had one chap who was misdiagnosed he had such a tremor dominant parkinson's disease that um i i did, we didn't realize it was certainly I, i'm not a neurologist but we didn't realize it was parkinson's we thought it was been an essential tremor he had a fantastic response but when you see him now he's very typically parkinsonian but he's several years on and so the the things will catch up with you but secondly i think a lot of our negative responses were actually due probably to less well placed electrodes so i would for parkinsons i would not go even for a tremor dominant one i wouldn't go for the um, vim or the, the thalamus i would still go for one of the other two targets there is another question sir how to proceed by a common general neurosurgeon 
and setup required for doing this please highlight for the beginners so i will go to dr sanke sir because uh, dr anwar ul hok from riyadh is asking so so my my suggestion to this uh, young doctor would be to try and get an interested neurologist first make sure that you have a neurologist and uh, someone who is going to you know do a good case selection before uh, you know trying to go into any other indications and in fact uh, i would probably say that though parkinsons is something which is a very common thing but i would still say uh, choose either of the target whether it is stn or gpi and as i is repeatedly saying and so was melin that gpi is still something a target which we all love still so stick to basics make sure you have a neurologist on board uh, don't jump into anything complicated uh, whether you want to use stn or gpi is something you would have a common discussion with your neurologist and then make sure you are extremely comfortable with uh, you know the uh, and aware about these uh, possible side effects of uh, straightforward dbs whether it is stn or gpi and try and do at most to you know be at the target and avoid any major complications stick to the thumb rules and what do i say if you are really going to start off a program with anything complicated it can just dissuade you so badly yeah, that you just give up on it So stick to basics is what I would say. Yes, uh, and is also okay. is questioning how? Okay. To, yes, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Anwar, Dr. Jawad Bajwa is in Riyadh. He is a yeah. movement disorder trained neurologist. He was with us in Cleveland Clinic. He is in King Fahad Hospital. He already has a program there, and he is an excellent neurologist. He can do mapping, programming, everything. So talk to him, and uh, if you have a neurologist like that, you can always start a program. Yes. The other question is, what do you need from the point of view of expensive kit? <laughs> um, and 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 you know that that's pe people imagine that in in the UK we're very different for, to you in India, and in fact we are under fairly serious monetary controls as well. And I've had to beg and steal and borrow over the years. But all you need, really, you need an MRI and. clearly you're not going to get anywhere without that and you probably need a ct and and i think we've all got that you need a frame but the frame will last you forever it is bomb proof one frame will last for years and years and years and other than that there is nothing very expensive that you need other than the implants and the the cost of the implant is overwhelmingly the biggest problem with dbs um uh, repeated discussions with the companies particularly with uh, spinal cord stimulation for pain i've said to them if you go to a country like like india or the whole of the african continent you could sell millions of these if you just reduce the price and you have to go to an equation between quantity and price and they will not do it they simply won't do it the discounts you get for regions are very very small and i think it's the same with this the, the prices of the dbs kits are wildly overinflated and that's the biggest barrier that i can see to starting this up but regarding what you need to start it the people are the important thing as as uh, both millens have said it it really is very very important to have enthusiastic people that's one of our problems i was worried you were going to ask me about the other indications because we have enough trouble getting our neurologists to first the parkinson's patients they just sit on them and give them drugs so in, in the people are the important thing yes you can see few questions from pakistan sir peshawar and karachi that how to calculate the coordinates so i think uh, we have already discussed how to calculate the co coordinates uh, and and we have already discussed and another question is there does deep brain stimulation any side effects like complications so we have already discussed Sir, Dr. Millins, sir, we, Dr. Devakar, will you answer these questions? Complications. Oh yeah, there are complications. There are basically three types of complications. One is in uh, bleeding, and doesn't happen. But if it happens, uh, it's devastating. 
we are in uh, close to midbrain, so for STN. Uh, risk of that is very, very small uh, in literature. It's anywhere between 0.5 to 3%. We have seen close to 0.5%. Symptomatic bleeding is less than 0.25%. So it's a small number. And you got to do things to avoid it. You stop the antiplatelets, you stop the anticoagulation, you keep the blood pressure under certain limit. And you make sure that when you're planning your track, that's why we do contra uh, contrast MRI scan, but a lot of places don't do contrast MRI scan, Lozano doesn't do it. Uh, and there is no much uh, difference in the bleeding rates. Second is infection. Anytime you put in a implant, there is a risk of infection, generally in the range of about 2% or less. Third is uh, um, hardware complications. So the leads can uh, break and migrate and erode and batteries can flip and uh, all those things, and then there are stipulation and use uh, complications. If you put in wrong programming, it might get worse, and uh, things like that can happen. Uh, cognition, there are cognitive complications. Uh, if you're not, prop not properly selected patient, you can hit the cognition. So all these things, those are all the complications. But altogether, there are probably less than 2%. It's a small percentage of patients who will get complications. The reason for getting complications is haven't selected patient right, or you don't know your stereotaxy, uh, you're overconfident, uh, but apart from that, you should not get a complication. One question is there, sir, uh, regarding the Alzheimer's disease. Is there any indication of the Alzheimer's disease? Dr. Dibba, as you... Alzheimer's disease. You comment about the, it's, uh, though it has been mentioned in like one of the indications, like uh, the off-label indication, but usually we don't go for a release. In general, in general practice, we have not taken any patients on Alzheimer's disease because the outcomes are really that great. How much? How much time? Uh, Amit, how much time we have left? Uh, are we wrapping up or can I tell a story? Yeah, we'll, we'll finish it. Up. Another question is there, sir, regarding writer's No, 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 no. I was, I was asking because can I tell a story about it? Yeah, yeah. We have enough time. There is no problem of the bandwidth. So, uh, you know uh, the lobotomist, the uh, guy who, Walter Friedman, who did lobotomies. He was an excellent, excellent neurologist. And uh, he trained in um, uh, France in La, uh, La Salpa. And then came back and became a psychiatrist and designed this uh, lobotomy. And uh, there is an author, American author, Jack L. High, who wrote the book Lobotomist on him. Um, so I was having dinner with him and I asked him, how come a person who was so intelligent, brilliant, I mean, he was a brilliant mind, trained with brilliant people. And then he was labeled monster because he used to do lobotomies in town square with ice pick. Uh, An electroshock patient will get stunned and put ice pick through the eyelid and turn it around uh, 120 degrees to cause the lobotomy. So where does this conversion happen? And he said, when you are good at a therapy or when you invent a therapy, you become more loyal to the therapy and you are not loyal to the patients. And when that happens, you try to apply that therapy in indications which are not really indications. So a disease should find a solution. A solution should never find a disease. When that starts happening, then the results are not good. And I think all these other indications that we are trying nowadays, obesity or, I, mean, I don't know, addiction, we are still doing the work, or Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a global problem. You cannot put an electrode in part of brain and expect the brain yeah. to light up like a light bulb. So that doesn't happen. But we are, because we are a hammer, the world looks like a nail to us because we can do DPS well, we're trying to do it in indications which are not really uh, good indications. And Alzheimer's is one of those. That's what I wanted to say. Just a yes, another question is regarding the writer scram. I think I will go to Dr. Rishikesh Kumar. What is the treatment, sir? He asked uh, one Dr. Boivab from Maharashtra. Yeah, if you have the treatment for writer scram, this is a focal task specific dystonia. And uh, uh, of course, DBS, we are talking about DBS today. So DBS is one option, but that option comes, uh, I would say, uh, later stage. In earlier stage, first of all, we explain the patient about the outcome. This is not uh, not so malign condition. It won't go into uh, Parkinson disease. And if they can change the lifestyle, that's fine. Because this is going to be there with for, for rest of the life. We do try 
medications like anticholinergics, clonazepam, and the baclofen. These are three are major medications. But I can tell you that the response to medications are uh, that this is suboptimal. And to in zeal to achieve the response, we go higher dose of clonazepam, and uh, in the bargain, the patient's cognition drops, patient memory drops, which is not a good thing. Botox is a wonderful option, but in writer's cramp, again, Botox is not as effective as blepharospasm or cervical dystonia. But generally, 60 to 70 percent patients they respond to Botox to a reasonable extent. So one question, one answer I have to give, I'll, I'll give uh, Botox injection under EMG guidance because writer's cramp is a very fine thing you have to, uh, it's not a spasticity. So under EMG guidance, and that, that works well. Well, one uh, video Dr. Sankhya has shown about writer's cramp. In those patients where it's very, very important and it's not responding to anything, then we can think of DBS. But DBS doesn't come as a first line treatment of uh, writer's cramp. Botox is. So that, that video, if I can specify, is actually not a DBS. It's a lesioning. Hello, sorry. Hello, Dr. Yeah. yeah. It's a lesioning. Now, uh, in fact, a lot of these uh, focal task-specific dystonias, whether it's writer's cramp or, for that matter, physician's dystonia, as uh, Taira went on to uh, uh, show the world as to how, what good results can be achieved. And... Uh, We've had a couple of cases as well of musicians uh, dystonia. Now, these, these patients uh, do extremely well uh, following lesioning. So it is, you don't need to do a DBS for all of these cases. And DBS uh, is something which is a very expensive proposition, as I said. And it's a unilateral condition. One does well with the lesioning as well. Uh, Sure enough, Botox is something which was tried for my patients as well. Yeah, one another question whether it can be done in district level. Yes, if everything is there, then of course we can uh, we can do it at district level. One question is from Chennai. So, what is the overall outcome of DBS? So, what answer you will give, Dr. Rishikesh Kumar and Dr. Divya? What is the overall outcome? Do you think uh, we should get? Dr. Lakshmi Priya from Chennai, he asked. In a patients, like who are in a, after, if a patient is selected well, if it's a, a young onset Parkinson's disease, um, who has started developing motor fluctuations, we have seen that we have patients about uh, 10 years, 15 years follow, who are, who are doing quite well. Uh, of course, by, by that time, they will have some other uh, gait and axial symptoms. But still, definitely, they are much better than patients who have not undergone disease. So, a good patient selection, a good programming, and uh, overall, because you need a social support, everything has to be good. So, if it is done in those terms, if the patient is carefully selected, well monitored, uh, and if he has a good support in terms of taking care of not only the battery related issues and everything. I think it has a very good outcome and like you are, we have seen other patients who are sitting in our clinic and then when the patient comes in a very bad state and he just walks out after the programming session. It's a very gratifying experience for us as well as with somebody else who is an onlooker feel what has he done. He just came and then they did something with the battery and then he just walks like a robot. So if, if you're a carefully selected patient, definitely it's a very good uh, procedure. And it can be really life-changing in patients who are quite young. The only problem is the cost, but I think uh, that should come down in maybe in the next few years at least. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, it's really gratifying. I would say the overall experience is really gratifying. Uh, as Alistair told that we are not among those neurologists who sit on the patient giving medications for a long, long time. So <laughs> if, we, if we have patient indicated, we'll like to yeah. uh, go for DBS. If a yeah. patient will select it, proper diagnosis, lead well placed. If the patient is not, not doing well, I will be surprised. Yes. Generally, uh, we, we hardly see any patient who well selected, well placed lead and they don't do well. So that's my... Uh, Same with any surgery. It's, uh, the surgery is 99% patient selection and 1% how brilliant you are. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> is, Amit, Amit could, could I possibly give... There's so many questions, it'd be quite ni nice to try to answer as many of them as possible very quickly. Yes, I suspect yes. of, the, of the first 20 or so, we've actually answered most of them, like question four, how to confirm implantation of the electrode. I think we've done that. But qu question seven, 
why do you shave the head for surgery? I think that's very variable. I shave a strip between the two sides and then I extend it to the back for where I'm tunneling. And that actually, in people with any haircut that I can see on the screen right now, um, apart from perhaps yours, Rishi, uh, <laughs> would, would be pretty much invisible. Um, question eight, how to avoid or prevent Alzheimer's disease? If I knew that, I would be sitting on a desert island drinking a very large whiskey and enjoying myself. I wouldn't be sitting here talking on, uh, I mean, it'd be lovely to think that we could do it, but this is a disease that's all over the brain with protein tangles and all the rest of it. And sadly, I don't think we're going to have the answer to that. Um, question 11, how long the effect is present? That's a very good question. And I've been doing this for a number of years now. And all I can say is that the effect lasts as long as I've been doing it. If you get a good target, uh, certainly with the STN, it goes on for a very, very long time. I think, I, I suspect, I see some others nodding. Depression and bipolar. I don't know about the others experience. There is some anecdotal fairly, or maybe more than anecdotal for DBS, but my personal preference for, at the moment is a VNS. VNS, vagus nerve stimulation, is much less invasive and actually gives some very, very good results indeed for that. But that's very com um, com a very complex question. And finally, question 21, what are the coordinates for the thalamic stimulation? I only say this because uh, Milan Diogranka was taking the mickey out of me earlier on. Would you like to know my coordinates? <laughs> At the ACPC plane or two millimeters above, one third of the distance forwards from the PC to the AC and 13 millimeters lateral and 11 millimeters lateral to the side of the third ventricle if you have a large third, large third ventricle. So there you go. It's very easy. One third of the distance back to front on the plane or just above it and 30 millimeters lateral. Any, any descent on that one? Yeah, remembered right, 11 to 13. So that's what you told me. This was in 1998 or something like that. So. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Pleasant memories for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, one, one question is there regarding the RF destructions, radio frequency. So I think Dr. Billing Sankhe has done uh, cases. So do you still use RF destruction? And in what are those cases? This is the question from Egypt. Dr. Abdel Ismail. I, <laughs> if I can uh, modify that question, I would call it RF lesioning rather than destruction. And uh, uh, strong uh, reasons for uh, use of uh, radio frequency. One should, uh, I, as my personal belief is that uh, DBS. Uh, and RF both go hand in hand. One cannot just uh, uh, carry beliefs that if you are doing DBS, there is no role for RF lesioning. RF lesioning has a significant role. And the use of uh, uh, whether it is palliative lesioning or for that matter, thalamotomies is uh, only going to widen. Uh, it's extremely cost effective. It's something which is... Uh, uh, easily uh, doable and if you do a big enough lesion you have extremely long lasting effects sure enough you've got to be very very uh, careful as to what uh, lesioning parameters you use but uh, that is something which uh, is uh, you know you learn that and it is not difficult at all a very 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 uh, useful technique one should not uh, downplay lesioning at all, particularly not in any part of the world, according to me, and certainly not in uh, you know countries where you know there is a significant uh, economic compulsion to many of the treatments. So, big time, big time fan of lesioning. I think lesioning is becoming much more on the uh, on the horizon again with the so-called minimally invasive uh, focused ultrasound. Um, I do take issue with it. I think the focused ultrasound has been its own worst enemy because it had an extremely aggressive marketing 
strategy, which put an awful lot of this off. But the fact remains that it's very attractive to patients because patients think of invasiveness as what a surgeon does. They don't think of invasiveness as what's actually done in the middle of your brain. And if you produce a commotion in the middle of the brain with a gamma knife or an MR guided focus ultrasound or an open lesion, actually there's very little difference between the three of them. But the patient sees the burr hole as being the very important thing. So I think the jury's out, but I think it may be that that is the going to be the future of lesioning, is the focused ultrasound. Also, you can, you know, you can get a feel for it as, it as the lesion is progressing, and you can stop if it's not working. So yeah. if, I, if I could just answer or add on to what uh, Alistair said just now, um, the gamma knife is extremely appealing, very, very appealing, um, you know, and uh, I've uh, I've done, uh, I haven't regretted it, but uh, I gave up after doing one gamma knife uh, uh, pallidotomy for a young girl who had um, post lesioning, a uh, post uh, tuberculous uh, lesion. She developed a severe hemidystonia. And I went on to do a gamma knife uh, lesioning. And uh, so far, I haven't regretted it, but I must admit that uh, I have been very, very scared about using a 4mm collimator, and I find that as a major limitation. And the uh, uh, amount of radiation that uh, I have uh, subjected that young girl to, and I swore to myself that I would probably never ever do it again. Uh, not because of anything else, uh, just uh, for the fear of uh, giving her you know, complete everlasting uh, hemiplegia as such. Though I think the she, scary she, thing about Gamma Knife, uh, Melinda, is is looking at the MRI scans a few months later, isn't it? And we right. find this in, with Gamma Knife for hippocampectomy. Unbelievably scary stuff. The patients yeah. don't seem mostly to be very sick, but my God, it, it doesn't just concentrate itself on the one tiny spot in the brain, does it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but what what uh, uh, both of you said, uh, we we are doing more uh, MR guided uh, ultrasounds now than DBS for tremors, because when you give both the options to patients, patients will jump on uh, MRG if you ask, and it's a beautiful procedure. I didn't like it initially, but uh, we're doing close to six to seven a week now uh, since it was it got approved by Medicare. So. Patient goes in, you put in uh, low sonication, you see the tremor stopping, there is no lesion, and then you keep on increasing the sonication. And then patient comes out and walks home. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, and uh, we don't know what happens after five years, 10 years, but four years- Are you years doing it bilaterally, now, Millen? What's that? Are you doing it bilaterally? No, 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 it's only approved unilaterally. Uh, in FDA only approved it unilaterally, so we're just doing it yeah. unilaterally. That's the problem, uh, you know, that, that's one of the reasons that I was on the committee trying to see what it was like for NICE, you know, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence here. And I, I gave it a bit of a thumbs down because how many people really are going to benefit from a unilateral cessation of a severe tremor? It's patient's perception. You give them a choice that, listen, we can do bilateral, but then it's surgery. You can do unilateral, get one hand fixed. Uh, and there is no incision and, and the patients see that way that okay let's get this done they ask us after a year or two if i want the second side dbs done can you do it we say yes we can do it so yeah uh, well that's really what i said wasn't it that, that, that it's more appealing to a patient because they think invasiveness is, yeah. is what's on the outside not what's on the inside yeah that's right sir we'll go to question number 15. see question number 15 again the whether DBS is helpful in depression and mania and bipolar disorder. The question is asked from United States. I think we discussed it already, right? Yeah, we have discussed it, yes, sir. And how to develop the brain power, that's a good one. Question 17, how to develop the brain power? Um, not with DBS, I would think. <laughs> 
Yeah, more or less, I think we have this. We have uh, answered all the questions. Uh, uh, so, Amit, uh, there is the last question which I have added by Santosh later. Uh, why do neurologists wait till patient develops dyskinesia then refer to surgery? Why not early? So I'll let the neurologist answer it. But my take on it is there is an early DBS trial. And it does work in young uh, onset patients. But it's an unpredictable disease. You can go on uh, for a long time without uh, really developing um, side effects like motor fluctuations or dyskinesia. And it's a brain surgery. However safe we tell it is, uh, I think the treating neurologist, we and the patient all have to be uh, sure in their mind that they have tried all non-surgical things. So it's prudent to wait for at least some time. So uh, we all know about early stim trial. We know about very early stim trial. We know about emotional exchange after that. The authors reply uh, to the to the criticism. Now I would say that uh, uh, presence of dyskinesia, even mild dyskinesia, give us the confidence that this is Parkinson's disease. Absolutely. In many many cases, the patient may look like Parkinson's disease to the best possible moment to the specialist to surgeon, but it fools you. After three, four years, it can change, and then you can start seeing the vertical gaze palsy. They can st start seeing a um, posture drop in blood pressure, and then you feel that this was not Parkinson's, this was MSA, or this was uh, PSP. If by that time you have done uh, surgery, then you, you, you will kick, kick yourself, right? So it's always good to wait for four to five years to know exactly that what is, how does it behave. And for four to five years, levodopar works wonderfully. So there's no hurry to go uh, jump for the study for in initial a few years. I think that's a very yes. good answer. Yes, I think uh, we have answered all the questions and uh, we can now go to Mr. Naik to conclude and end of the session. Well, thank you very much. This was a wonderful session on DBS. And when the masters speak, uh, about the technique and uh, the technology, the followers come and listen to them and they have come in plenty today. Uh, very happy to inform you that 422 doctors logged in today to see this uh, webinar from 12 countries and 87 doctors have logged in from abroad. So uh, thank you very much to our speakers, Professor Dr. Milin Devgaukar, Dr. Alistair Jenkins, Dr. Milin Sanke for this wonderful uh, lectures and their uh, own experience of how I do it. And very well supported by discussion panel, Dr. Rishikesh Kumar and Dr. Divya KP. Uh, thank you very much for attending this session and supporting the, the discussion. And thank you, Dr. Amit Kumar Ghosh for conceptualizing this topic and coordinating with uh, the international and uh, national speakers. Uh, we from Health and You really enjoy carrying this uh, webinar and giving the technical support. Uh, please continue to write Health and You products. And thank you so much for taking care of COVID patients and in difficult patients, taking care of the, the difficult patients taking care in these difficult times. So uh, from Health and You, this is Deepak Naik signing off on behalf of all of you. Uh, once again, thank you audience for joining us, taking your time. I hope you must have found this very, very interesting and enlightening session. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Good night, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much.